on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This the people party one, two, three, back in effect, back in the house. It's Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. This is the world's best podcast, the People's Party. Always and as usual, I got my lovely and talented co-host Jasmine Lee and a place to be. What's up, Jasmine? Woo! What's up? How you doing? I'm doing great. Feeling you like look, a million bucks. You're looking very business casual. Like you work nine to five, like you about to switch out of your heels into your pumps and go do aerobics. <laughs> yes, that is that's exactly the vibe I was going for. It's given nine to five aerobics punk chic. No doubt, no doubt. Well, we are back in our studio um, in California. And once again, I want to give a shout out to all the essential workers who didn't have the privilege to be able to go someplace else and not have to come into work. And definitely want to shout out my staff and my crew for helping to set this up. Today's People's Party, we're going to have a lot of fun. This man that we have as a guest today is one of my personal, personal friends, and I'm proud to say that. He is a consummate musician. He plays every single instrument. He raps, he sings, he could play keys, he could play horn, what you want. He could probably play recorder like jazz maybe. Play. I play a flute. <laughs> jazz flute, all of that. He's worked with some of the best, brightest, biggest in the game, from Kendrick Lamar to Snoop Dogg to Busta Rhymes, to the game to Stevie Wonder to Herbie Hancock to YG to Quincy Jones to her to Robert Glasper, Ab Soul, Rafael Sadiq, Charlie Wilson, myself. You've heard him all over to Pimp a Butterfly and other projects from TDE. He has eight albums to his name. Nine EPs, six of which came out of 2020, so we're going to get into that, including Soul Juice, which is about different foods and being nutritious through musical <laughs> form. Uh, he's dropped seven mixtapes, including Here My Dear, With My People's Devi Dev, and brought us the album Three Chord Fold, the Grammy-winning Velvet Portrait, which is one of my favorite albums of all time, and last year's Dinner Party, which he made with Kamasi Washington, Robert Glasper, and The Great Ninth Wonder. He's got the ear of legends like Glasper and Herbie Hancock and Dr. Dre and K-Dot and Thundercat. And if you're looking for a name in this industry who is held in utmost regard by gangsters and jazz artists at the same time, you just found him. This man said, we do not care about record sales. We just care about art. This mm -hmm. man said, if somebody is helping you feed your family, then you protect them by any means. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Terrace Martin in the first hey, hey. Hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watching him watch you do his intro was amazing. Yeah, I was like, shit, that all happened, man. <laughs> I've known Terrace for a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all of these things happened after I met you. Yeah. Which yeah. is crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, the last time I seen you, you just reminded me was at the Montreux Jazz Festival for Quincy Jones' birthday. In Switzerland. In Switzerland. Switzerland, Switzerland yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a great experience. That was three in the morning. Three in the morning. To like 10 in the morning. That yeah. was those right. hours. Uh, Yasin and I had a show. I want to say it was in, I don't know where we was at. Amsterdam, maybe? I don't, wherever was driving distance to where we was at. Yeah. Yasin Bay and I had a show. and We drove to see you and Robert Glasper play for Quincy Jones. And we got on stage. Y'all got on stage and rock. I remember I was rapping. And I don't have a relationship with Quincy like you do. Um, I am on Quincy Jones' album. Yeah. I redid the theme to Ironside with my friend Kendra Ross, shout out to Kendra Ross, on that Quincy Jones album. It's the opener to that album, uh, Soul Bossa Nova. Yep, That's the yep, album. Yep. Uh, but I don't got a relationship with him like you. And I know he loves hip hop mm -hmm. because I listened to, I remember I had Back on the Block. I remember he was rocking with Big Daddy Kane yeah. and all of them. Ice-T. Ice-T, that's right. But when I was rapping, because I don't think I was like invited like that. Yeah. I think I was invited by Robert, not by hey. Quincy. I remember <laughs> I was rapping I was, and he was just looking at me like, <laughs> I was rapping at my birthday party. That's <laughs> man, but it's good to see you, man, backstage side. Way, yeah, that that's is 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 it's always fun seeing your family, people that you love, in in, in different places. You know, because sometimes them those far places, man. The, you know, I mean, bottom line is like no matter how much fun you're having, if you're not from there, mm -hmm. it gets lonely sometimes. So yeah, when you yeah. see a, a face from the crib, it's like, yeah. hey, what's up? Yeah. You know, you know, it was like, wow, you know. Yeah, that was dope. Yeah. Um, now, Terrace Martin is your name, mm -hmm. but everybody calls you Terrence. Does that ever annoy you? No. Okay. That's good. No. Yeah. Very because, you know, I, you. I grew up doing like, you know, I, I mean, I grew up doing licks and crime and shit. Where I, I was happy you called me a different 
<laughs> you know, Fact. his name was Terrence. His right, Terrence, Terrence, Terrence. And then they, like, nah, that ain't, I ain't Terrence. You know? <laughs> that ain't me. <laughs> my friend always tells me I need to humble myself because whenever someone spells my name right, like I won't respond to it, no matter what it is. Uh, they they put an E on my name. I mean, wrong. If mm-hmm. someone spells my name wrong, I like won't respond to it whether it's an E or not. So you're a lot more humble than me. Oh, I yeah. gotta get like Terrence. I, I yeah. gotta get like Terrence, not Terrence. Homeboy Terrence. Terrence. I get more like him. Snoop called me Terrence for like seven years. But it's Snoop. I wouldn't do that. Did he self correct or you corrected him? He switches us up still sometimes. Sometimes, you right? You know, I, I think I'm both names to him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is cool. Our producer kept writing Terrence in the group chat. Right. And I kept writing Terrence to see if he responded to it. And he kept being like Terrence. And then I, so that's why I put this question in there. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. that was and you know, I, I don't even correct people no more. Right. Terrence Martin, cool, boom, cool. I'm on. Let's go. I'm on. No doubt. Um, one of my favorite songs from my career um, that has helped my career a lot is Favela Love, which we worked on with Sam yeah. George. Yeah. You gave me this beat. I kept listening to it. I took a trip to um, to Sao Paulo, and this was back when I was on Twitter, and I tweeted that, uh, man, it would be cool to do a song with Sam George. And his manager, somebody he was working with at the time, hit me back and got him to the studio. Damn. When I flew back to I flew to Rio a couple of years later to do the video with him, and he confessed to me that when he did the song, he didn't know who I was. Wow. He just did the song, and the strength of this dude was like, "Yo, you need to do this." That's dope. It's real dope because he's a great artist, and um, thank you for doing that record with me. Man, thank you for I didn't turn me on to him. I didn't know anything about him at all mm-hmm. until that. Until mm-hmm. then, I tried, I said, "Whoa!" Then so many other people knew about him, but me. Mm-hmm. I was right, like, "Whoa, right. this." This is a thing, right? This is a guy. And I heard his other music. I, I fell in love with his art, and I yeah. was like, "Wow!" I was, thank you for turning me on. I, yeah. I think we all benefited from that. You know? No doubt. Now, first song we ever did together was "Give Him Hell." Give Him Hell, yeah. You and Battle Cat, yeah. And um, Coy Madison, am I pronouncing Coy Madison? Right? Yeah, yeah. Life Jennings. I was hanging out with him back then, and uh, he heard the song. I was like, "Yo, I gotta be on that, bro." So that's how life is on it. Yeah. And he has that little part I of I remember the that. Yeah. Um, I didn't know you were such a great musician back then. Ah. I just thought you was like the little homie who had some beats. Yeah. You know, you would be at the crib. I think he was working with Debbie Dev around that time. Yeah. yeah. Wait, Debbie, no, no, no. It was before that. On, on Give Him Hell? Yeah. Yeah. Give Him Hell was me and you were way before oh, okay. any, anything, anything. Yeah, you would pop by the crib. Do you remember how we even how I even got that beat from you? Because I really don't. I was testing myself today because I, I, I said, how did, how did I first see you? Right. But but I, I know that beat was done way before uh, before Instagram, Twitter, did any of that stuff. So I, 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 I want to say- Black Pan- Planet Days. I Black say, Planet Days. It's a Black Planet beat. I want to say the beat was done like 2006 or something like mm-hmm. that. And you had a shortly right after that. So, nah, nah, I don't, I don't know. But I didn't, because I didn't meet Debbie Dev till later on. Okay, yeah. yeah. How'd you meet Debbie Dev? You? I don't see. I don't know. I don't remember. Damn. I remember Look that. He was related. I remember shit. that I was living with EQ, mm-hmm. and somehow you knew EQ and Kiera. Yeah, but I don't think the EQ can is how I got to you. Mm. I'm, I figured it out. It'll come. Okay. I have a great. That's yeah. It'll, it'll come. It'll yeah. come. It'll come. Because I remember being like, oh, oh, and EQ. That's why right. I remember, I remember was, that thing. But then you would come around. But you was at Warner, and I was at Warner. You were signed to Warner? I was signed to Warner as okay. a producer. Maybe I seen you in the hallways or something? Naeem Ali. Naeem I, Ali, yeah. No I was hanging out with Naeem a lot. Yeah. Ain't no telling. Mm. But we're here. We're here. <laughs> and you started coming around a lot when Devi Dev was coming around. She was working out of my garage. Yeah. And yeah. doing Left Effect, and then her and you started doing, you did the Hear My Dear Hear My thing. Dear, yeah. She, that, that project changed. That was me getting introduced to this new thing called the internet at that mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm, I was like young with the vets, mm-hmm. but I was older with the new. I was I'm right in the middle of everything, mm-hmm. so that was, that was the record that was the transition. Yeah. Um, I remember Calmatic, which is a brilliant video director and now movie director. He would come to my house when he was like 16, 17 with with, with Casey Veggie, mm-hmm. and he would say, "Man, you know," I said, "Man, you got to give away your music for free." Yeah. I was like, yeah, what you know? What the fuck are you talking about? Right, for free. You know, right, I gotta pay this mortgage. I got kid. What do you mean? Kid? I did Liberation with Mad Lib in that era. Yeah, I remember everybody was on me. Everybody in the industry was like, "What you doing?" Yeah, like you fucking it up. And he told me that he said, "Man, you need to get all your friends together. You know everybody." It's a, he was he, he Calmatic was the one that Calmatic. I credit him for really ushering my whole 
career to looking at the future instead of the now and the past. Because he was early on a lot of things, you know, so he would bring, you know, uh, people like um, Overdose by and all these different L.A. acts that was tied in with Dom Kennedy and all this. I was already hanging with, I was already doing records for TD because we all started together, but Mm -hmm. this was a new era. Also through this new era was, was when I still, you know, when, uh, K dot sent the email saying I'm changing my name to Kendrick Lamar. This, right. this now he was he was the young guy part of an older thing, but somehow when he did that around this timing, it was it was the new it was the turn of Los yeah. Angeles, you know. And I was saw some of that happening. Yeah, through Devi Dev. Yeah, um, she was very much into what was yeah. going on at the yeah. time. She had that show. She brought um, Thursday and them uh, you and I mm-hmm. to the crib. And yeah. they had the song with Kendrick. I think it was a remix. Mm-hmm. Uh, bitch Child. Bitch, I do this. Bitch, Child, do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that well, Devi, you know, Devi, Devi rolling all this is, I, I like to think of Devi as, as um, you know, you, you hear stories about classic names like, like a John McClain, mm-hmm. you know, from Janet Jackson mm-hmm. to Corrupt to just all these different things. And, and Debbie was kind of, she was on the radio. She was always in the radio, doing radio. And then, you know, she just had a spirit that made us all want to fuck with her. Mm-hmm. As a, 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 and as a as a sister, she was always classy. Mm-hmm. So you never, you know, she, you, you never, you never felt, comp- if you liked Debbie, you never felt comfortable coming <laughs> right, on to her. Right, right, you right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. And she's gorgeous, you know, mm-hmm. but, but you felt comfortable Tell her how you felt about your woman, mm-hmm. right? You know why? Right. Why? Why are you and your woman going through this? Well, in, in my case, right? You know why is this? And you know she she Debbie helped me, helped me understand the uh, you know the heart of a woman. Mm. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And, and even through that project, here my dear, that was like therapy. I, I was going through at that time my first kind of heartbreak breakup, which now I laugh at, but at that time mm. it was serious, and she was really. That she was over there helped me out mentally through that, and then Calmatic with putting out records, and then working with Kendrick and Dom and everything. Just it it was just it was kind of coming together just naturally, mm. you know. Yeah, man. Um, one more thing that you and I did together before we go on to mm-hmm. what you've done with everybody else is uh, I want to thank you again for blowing my horn with Corrupt mm. uh, and with On Point with Too Short for the Strong Arm Steady album. That's right. Yeah. Shout out to Mitchie Slick, Cron Dom, Feel the yep. Agony. Come on now. Yeah, man. That album is a classic. It is. I'm very proud to have been involved in that. Yeah. And the release of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you know, gave them some bangers. That was a big deal. Because that, that was like, it was like just everybody, family putting out a record. You was involved. Phil right. was involved. Cron. Right. Mitch. Everybody was involved, you know. But it was it was, it was a good vibe, man. It was a no good doubt. Vibe. No doubt. Now, you are from and represent what you have called the West Side of South Central. Mm-hmm. Uh, West Boulevard, Slauson, mm-hmm. um, Crip neighborhood, mm-hmm. rolling sixties, right? Mm-hmm. I've heard you talk about your version of Crippin being growing up around family men who protected the community and employ the African tradition of it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, and obviously the problems that come with gang banging are still there, obviously. Mm-hmm. But from the perspective of somebody who grew up in it, for someone who's outside of it like myself and a lot of people who are watching. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you break down what you mean about your version and your perception of what it meant to be a Crip growing up, being being different from what the world thinks it means? Yeah. Well, you know, for for, for me personally, you know, growing up in South Central and all through L.A., but mainly the west side of South Central, uh, Mm -hmm. the Crenshaw District, was those, as a young kid, those were the guys that I saw. Mm -hmm. Around, you know, those were the guys that I saw around, you know, uh, Crips that just happened to be from the area that I was living in, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, I was I was aware of a lot of things that was going down, but I was also equally aware of the greatness that was going down. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I always say, I, you know, like, I mean, some of the, the most of the best fathers I know in my life are, are real gangster homies, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, you know... And it's like they love their kids, they love their family. Mm-hmm. I, I, I know some real homeboys that don't don't even cuss around women. Mm-hmm. I grew up with that. I grew mm-hmm. up not, don't not cussing around women. I grew up don't hit no woman. I grew up with you know you see a woman getting tripped on, you discipline that man. I, I grew up that way. So these were the guys that instilled those. You know, I, I grew up like yo, if you ain't with 
the gun played and don't pick up a gun. Mm-hmm. I didn't grow up with we're gonna make you go, you know that. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I, a lot of lot of what I'm hearing in different generations that was happening. But I think a lot of that is sensationalized with movies as yeah. well mm-hmm. and, and media and everything because a real big homie, a real big homie like my big homies, you know what I'm saying? They always they always let me know the honesty truth and they said if you have a if you have any type of gift or ability to do anything, you should do that. You know what I'm saying? You'll be loved by the neighborhood, embraced yeah. by the neighborhood, but you should be you. So my perspective of of cripping has always been the most humblest thing ever. I mean, I've only seen gentlemen. Now don't don't get it fucked up. You know, it's 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 some shit. It's some yeah. shit that come with it. But you know what? It's some shit that come with everything. That's right. Mm-hmm. Like That's right. You know, I hate when motherfuckers say black on black crime and all man, there's some shit come with everything, bro. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, for me personally, you know, like I say, in my experience, 100% of the best fathers been gangsters. Mm. 100%. Uh, yeah. Protectors. Yeah. You know, providers. Everything what, what in my family mm-hmm. a man was taught to be. What the wrist is sounding like, I'm trying to say that what people perceive as gangsters uh, to represent the whole black community because certainly yeah. they don't yeah. but in a lot of ways people associate that stereotype with the representation of the whole black community mm-hmm. but you know the CDC and other organizations and places and institutions have put out reports to say that black fathers in America have spent more time with their children than any other demographic mm-hmm. yeah. the reason why it doesn't seem that way is because to, for a lot of reasons black people are more bound to be in abject poverty so we don't get married and the fathers don't stay in the house with the mothers Mm -hmm. as much but these fathers are largely still in the lives of their children more than any other community yeah i i don't me personally i I don't know any deadbeat fathers Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying if i come across a deadbeat father he probably ain't fucking with us Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm you know, because we don't, and, and my and my crew, we don't condone sucker shit. But that come from that soil, though. Mm-hmm. It's some we we have rules. You know, we just, you know, we push love at a high level, and so mm-hmm. did the the cats that turned me on. You know, my early career was all ran by cats from my neighborhood that mm-hmm. really helped me. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you got Big D, which is that off the hook fish on Slauson. Mm-hmm. Big D, Snoop, tur- he he put me on with Big D was my first placement. But um, under my name with Ludacris and, and Shauna, Big D also managed Battle Cat, Snoop, him and Donnie. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like, you know, and they they always taught a lot of us from that area to always uh, walk with love, consciousness, yes. read books, smart, learn about your deals, know about points, know mm-hmm. who is who. You know, so th- those are the, the gangsters that I grew up yeah. seeing. And that's what that means to me. Yeah. The same thing with the blood card, though. I got family mm-hmm. that's, that's bloods as well. It's the same. It's all African shit, though. Right. Yeah. It's all African. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's not. It's, it's all 100. It's tribal. It's African. Who and who taught me that is Nipsey. He was younger than me. He can make that connection. He taught he me in his family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He. I remember I was going to Africa for the first time. I'm about to go to Africa. He said, "Man, I gotta pull up on you and tell you what's up." Mm-hmm. And he pulled up on me and he gave me a whole. Four hour, he like you know what I'm saying. He, he gave you a whole yeah. four hour thing on self hate. I yeah. never heard the, the how he looked at it. And he, one of the conversations we had was saying the word nigga in Africa. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But he was so he he looked at that shit like that, and he was he was younger than me, but he was already influenced me, the homie Lorenz. He was influencing all of us, giving us books and giving us game, coming to the gigs and everything, just always preaching that. Especially if you was with all the shit, he he always was on. Be with all the shit, but understand where the shit come from, and you know. Rest right. in peace, Nick. Yeah, rest in peace, Nick. I had the same experience as you because I'm from Roosevelt, which is a quote unquote horrible neighborhood, <laughs> but like everybody looked out, and I had so many mentors and things of that nature where I could have went a whole nother way, but mm-hmm. I didn't because they saw, okay, you have this. Let me focus on pulling that out. And then even now, I live literally walking distance to Crenshaw and Slauson. And I'm good in the hood. People like to, like to talk shit about where I live, but it's like, I know I'm protected. Yeah. My ex was walking my dog down the street, and somebody stopped and was like, yo, that's not your dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like, they really be paying attention, and they really look out. So yeah, yeah. I no, hate no, that, the stereotypes. The, 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 you know, 
you know, what society understands that, you know, the ghettos are the safest places in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bombs don't hit the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes don't even shake South Central like that. <laughs> now, no, I'm no, not, no, 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 no. I don't feel an earthquake. Yeah. No, 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 no. Listen, I'm from here. You that 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 earth that earthquake in North Ridge that that didn't shake watts <laughs> like that. I know for a fact. This is like science. Mm -hmm. This is the fault line. This is just right, what right. it is. You know that soil. You know, mm -hmm. things go crooked and and strange with different energies in these areas. Once you involve people that's not familiar, like the police and different things, right? Like Interlopers that. and all that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. But but these, which is it, why gangs even popped up in the first on. place. Like I mean, man, I mean yeah. the, I mean the bounty hunters and watch was was built on protecting the people from the police. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you know it's all like I say, it's all tribal. It's right. all tribal. You know. But so my my biggest influence comes from from the original foundation of, you know, people like to say gang. I like to say a tribe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to throw all this yeah. mud on this, but it's it's a tribe. And yes, it, it is discipline within the tribe. Like, it got to be. Mm -hmm. You see all the motherfuckers on Capitol March, you know, oh, yeah. did all that shit. They would have That was part. gang gang. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You know, that was working straight and saying, we going here. You know? right. like, like, just because they failed doesn't mean they wasn't serious. Yeah. yeah. They were serious. Yeah. Now, we ain't seen no homies do that, but they, no. they but the, 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 the homies the most dangerous gang. Like, look what happened. They right. almost got to the guy. Right. <laughs> um, John Singleton, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Yes. Um, he was an artist that made it out of the hood. Why is it why was he such an important role model? And do you remember how you felt about his movies when you were coming up? He was very important with staying close to the as we all are. We I think when you come from LA, when you from here, it's kind of a thing why you can't be too far from where you come from. You know what I'm saying? And and I think just knowing that John operated like that and was and was local and still a giant was the biggest mm. thing he could have gave any of us. Catching him, catching him on 10th and Jefferson at at Harold and Bell's, eating, you know, eating, eating a po' boy sandwich with no security. And he talked to you about everything. He also tell you, wait till I'm done eating and <laughs> right. sneak out that motherfucker, buddy. But <laughs> if you could get him, he'll talk to right. you. Right. And and that's on 10th and Jefferson, you know, or you could catch him. You know, back in the day uh, in L.A., you know what I'm saying, we had the African, the, the, we, we had the African marketplace at Dorsey High. And, and not Dorsey High, Rancho Park. Yeah, yeah, it was on the Dorsey High campus or the park the park near there. But you could always catch them there. So I think just, and for me, just like, whoa, that's John Singleton. Mm -hmm. Like, the same thing when you seen Ice Cube drive down Crenshaw. When you, you know, snooping them, it's like, whoa, that means, that means you could be that big. Mm -hmm. That means it's tangible. I could touch it, you know, for... A young kid that don't know how to believe in dreams, because everybody don't, you know, you, that's some, you know, that's, you know, to believe in the dream is that people think you could just do that shit. But yeah. Yeah. So for a kid that don't, that 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 I don't know the tools how to believe in the dream, but I'm seeing John Singleton uh, at the local shit. You know, back in the day, you could see Cube drive up and down Crenshaw and his Suzuki because he had his office, uh, street knowledge. You know, what I'm saying on 43rd and Crenshaw. Uh, right, right by the 1580 K Day building, which is the only hip hop station back that really they broke hip hop. Ain't about the first West Coast FM hip hop station in the country. Yeah, come on, say that. Yeah. So you know, with with they run DMC, LL, K Day, Greg Mack, and the Mac Attack, like all that was. That's another talk, but yeah, that that was you know just being able to see them like that is like was all we needed. All mm -hmm. we for the ones that wanted to inspire to be to be in that thing, you know. I remember hearing Kendrick always talks about when his father took him up to the cop and swapped me and he saw a pot. Mm. These are things that no matter what album we do, I'm going to hear that story. Yeah. Right. Because it it, it, it it impacted that guy. Just You know, I remember when I first saw Dr. Dre at the Rhodium Swap Me. No. Easy e at the Rhodium Swap Me two weeks later. Dr. Dre at the Guy concert, Hammer opening up. Kid and Play open in 1989, Universal Amphitheater. My aunties and them had, had backstage tickets, and we was right by the pit. And I couldn't see over. I couldn't see uh, Hammer. It was open enough for Guy at the time. And I couldn't see Hammer. And in front of me was Ren, Easy, Yella. And I was, like, worshiping them dudes, you know. And I remember Easy signed my Raiders hat and let me hang out with them all night, pick me up, put me right where I could see the show, backstage, Dr. Dre, Easy, Fresh Prince. Jazzy Jeff was no, I don't remember Jazzy Jeff. Kid and Play, Fresh Prince, NWA, all NWA. Cause I remember being like, "Yo, Dr. Dre is tall." 
you know, I'm a kid, you <laughs> yeah. know, but I'm seeing this in L.A. because my, my parents was in the industry, so we, we saw that shit, you know. Between growing up looking up to gangsters, now once again, easy, a gentleman. I remember him meeting my mom, and my mom like, my mom like, yo, he bugging y'all. He be like, nah, we got him, we got him. He never cussed that night. My mom always brings, you know, he never said a cuss word. Mm. It was fun to watch you close your eyes and go back to mm-hmm. that moment. Like yeah. you really went all the way. Oh, back. That, that was a moment, bro. We yeah. was all, we was. I remember I had a headache that whole day because I was excited to see Hammer. <laughs> you know, and God, I, I tell I told Teddy about this night every time I see Teddy. He remember that tour every night because Teddy, you know, he don't drink liquor. Right. So he none of that. He's like. Whoa. <laughs> so Teddy remember that night and the man I said, man, WA everybody was there. Th- that's when that's when acts would come to a city, New York, LA, and do three nights at an amphitheater. Mm-hmm. I mean, three nights. And packed. And you know, you would be I remember this every time a concert came, the excitement of seeing bootleg t-shirts on the street yeah. <laughs> going up to the concert. Yeah. You know, just and our tour. Remember the tour books you have when you go see a mm-hmm. tour? When I met Easy. And I've been knowing he was at the Rodium Swabby because my mom was buying my clothes from the Rodium. At the time, we lived in L.A., but the Rodium was the shit. The Rodium was where all... The Rodium was like... <laughs> you had to be there. The Rodium... <laughs> you try to put it in words, it could not. The, the Rodium was the mecca. <laughs> it was ran by a cat named Steve Yano. Rest mm-hmm. in peace, Steve Yano at the Rodium Swabby, meaning Gardena. But that's where Dre, Q, Quit. Everybody knows Steve Yano. Battle mm-hmm. Cat, Snoopy, everybody. Dre, ev- everybody. Steve Yano was like, he was an Asian cat and he had a record shop at the Rodeo Swap Meet. So my mom would, would like go get her clothes and say, go by the record shop and just sit there until I'm <laughs> back. And you know, she four or five hours getting the dress. Oh, you know no. what I'm saying? <laughs> but I'd be right there and Steve would be like, hey, 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 you heard a public ending? I'd be like, nah. He like, Bring the noise. Next week I come. He give me vinyl. Hey, hey. You know, I'm a, I, I might say some names, you know. Uh, cats like Dazzle Daz. MC Shad when his record came out. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, a, I was a kid. He was giving me these records. Records and then and then he gave me. I remember and I never will forget this motherfucking day. He <laughs> gave me his motherfucking record. And I looked on the record and it looked like all of my cousins in the fucking alley. Mm. And it was N.W.A. Dope man. Wow. And with Dope Man, and you know, on the other side, the B side, it was Dope Man Radio and Eight Ball. I don't drink Brass Monkey. Like the B Funky. Nickname Easy E, yo, Eight Ball Junkie. <laughs> man, when I heard that shit, and you looking at the cover, and you, my, you know, my, 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 mama don't know it's cussing. Mm-hmm. She ain't home yet. She not listening. You like, oh, but you know you got to cut this shit off of mama cub. Because she used to do playing. Because I he gave me that, and he gave me Christmas rap. Oh. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Don't stop. Let the jingle bells rock. You know, right. Chris, that album. You're talking so, about Curtis Blow Christmas rap. I'm talking yeah. about the one that Russ and them put yeah, out with yeah, the yeah. Adidas on the front. Do, 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 yeah, do, yeah, do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that record, I'm fast forward two weeks later, I'm playing that record, dressing up in Lokes, and the Raiders had looking in the mirror, saying the word. <laughs> and I thought my mom had went to church this Sunday. I fake sick. Oh my gosh. She's behind me the whole time. She took, she grabbed that record, she took it, and she broke that motherfucking <gasps> record. <Bam. laughs> that sounded like my mother. And for that, as a kid, Your in heart that broke. era. I said whatever made her break that record, because I'm so mad at her for doing that. I'm gonna make her break all my. I'm gonna make everybody <laughs> break a record. Right. I'm whatever, daddy. And I got addicted that young to the emotion of music fucking up your day. Mm. And I got addicted. And then after that, I just I was on the path. Man, I used to pray to work with doctors right now. Man. Great art is supposed to make you uncomfortable. Oh, and that's man. what you understood. Yeah. Out young. On a visceral level. Like, I'm supposed to, it's supposed to disrupt the energy. Man, let me tell you what she did. Play that record. I ain't gonna whoop you. Play the record. <laughs> <laughs> Where? So you like a whoop me short? She played that record. She went, I don't drink. <laughs> no, it was the same by the man who couldn't quit. Dope, dope man, man dope. please get her have another yeah. hit. The dope man saying, crack, I don't give a shit for if your girl nails down and suck my I'm dick. She went, oh, Lord, Jesus. <laughs> oh, Lord. Bam, broke that motherfucker. Well, 
not for nothing, but shout out to your mom for not making you sit in the car so you either even had the records to be able for her to break. Shout out to my mom. Yeah, definitely shout out to your mom. We're going to talk about your family for a second. It's all good. Your father, Curly Martin, yep. drummer in the emotions, in the Omaha Black Music Hall of Fame. Yeah. Serious, serious music, musician. Um, but also, for a while, struggled with a serious crack addi addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've heard you talk about being in the back seat during a high-speed chase, wow. seeing your father just go through all the motions uh, that yeah. somebody who's yeah. dealing with that addiction goes through, yeah. and him yeah. being real with you and not hiding it from you, but you also said that he was never physically abusive with you. No. So I want to ask you, how did living with a person who you loved and a person you know who loved you back, who had that addiction issue, how did that humanize other addicts in the era when people were looking at people who did crack like you the worst thing that could happen. Yeah, I didn't know he was a fucking addict because everybody was on this shit. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, everybody. You know, when crack came, it was like everybody watching family, everybody in the black community watching family TV, mm -hmm. and the UFO just dropped crack in everybody's house. That's mm -hmm. what this shit felt like, you yeah. know. So I, I didn't know it was a problem. I, I was too young. I just knew it was. This shit looks uncomfortable. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it was it it was a thing, man. Where like I I love my father, mm -hmm. like in and out, and that's I love everybody in and out. Like I I even this this fucked up business. I take the good with the bad and love it all. Mm -hmm. You feel me? I I take the Grammys like I take the losses. Mm -hmm. You know, I I take the losing the house like I take with buying the house. I take yeah. it all equally. I don't separate the feeling. I learned that from going through that because you can't. Like I don't believe in a uh, selective compassion. I don't mm -hmm. believe in like if, if you love, you love. Yeah. You know, in, in my in my world, in my world, you know, motherfuckers be, you know, I seen your Instagram. They are everybody got a damn of God damn right. shit, man. I can't, you you can't say shit. No, I can't say can. shit. <laughs> but but for me, you know, what what growing up with him, because he was a musician, going back to my I always been around my whole life. Men that love their family. And men that will do anything to protect their family and to feed their family. And my father was one of those musicians that was like that. Mm -hmm. My dad was all art. He's still art. Call him right now. He'll tell you he, you know, he's seen Elvin Jones levitating. Wow. And I believe yeah. him because I've yeah. seen, I've seen some cats levitate off playing an instrument, off getting on a mic, and I've seen some things that I can't explain, and people think I'm crazy. So, but I've seen some things. So, my father is this kind of guy, but he, he's a He's every level of a man I look up to with Snoop, this. My dad embodies that similar thing where art, love, but don't get it fucked up. You trip. I'm I'm going to finish it. I'm going to go. You know, I, I grew up with John Coltrane, Elvin Jones. My dad had a healthy gun collection. And, you know, and and he was he was he had an addiction, but he was also selling dope. Mm -hmm. So we we grew, and it was in in the middle of hype of gang banging in South Central, but he only was forced to do all this because at a time in L.A. I remember I tell everybody, you know I I remember every musician, and from like the '70s to the '80s, mm -hmm. had houses in L.A. Mm -hmm. and every other house was a musician family, and you know the wife was a musician and father, and sometimes they had day jobs and just sessions at night, yeah. but it was so many. Black people with houses and homes, and then crack came. You know, when crack came, that thing, you know, when crack came, the guns changed. Because the money changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so semi-automatic shit came through. Yeah. You know, so everything. So my, my dad is a victim of, like, most, uh, 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 I'm speaking what I know about, most black artists that I've known that have suffered through addiction. My father's a victim of a broken heart. Mm. You know, people always say that person died of an overdose, and mm -hmm. in my family, we couldn't say that. My father overdosed, mm. broken heart. Mm. He mm. told me young, he was like, "Man, this motherfucker." You know, he taught me the heart. When I got with Snoop, Snoop taught me how to manage the stomach. Mm. Mm. You Your know, gut. and 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 you know, like he 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 told me like an old player told him, you know. Everybody get their heart broken in the street, especially if you're being a player, if you're pimping, whatever the case is. Not condoning none. I'm just saying those characteristics. It ain't the heart you got to worry about. Get your stomach tight for shit. Mm -hmm. The first thing you think about when you hurt 
It ain't your heart. You don't, don't nobody feel they. F- if you feel your heart hurt, you better call 911 fast as fuck. Mm-hmm. You feel that stomach hurt. Mm-hmm. Little lips stop shaking, you know. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's that yeah. stomach, whether somebody passes, somebody is is being dishonest in business or personal relationships. They right? say that your gut is your first brain. Your mm-hmm. gut, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why the gut also holds all the diseases in yeah. your life. That's why it's important for brothers and, and men, all lo- and people, but but the brothers out there, you know, get it checked out, get the prostate checked out, eat well, take sea moss, keep that meat alone, make sure the water is a certain thing, you know, stay away from broccoli and certain. It's broccoli. it's important to take care of the gut because the gut holds all the, all the diseases. It also holds all the physical stress and all of the spiritual stress. Mm-hmm. So so for me, going through all that shit with my father, I had to get a strong gut. At a at a young age, I remember my mom catching them cheating. They gonna hate when they hear this shit, but fuck it, <laughs> their house is paid for. It. <laughs> the so people's they, party. Yeah, my mom was my mom called him cheating. This is like you know, I don't know, maybe ninety. Well, I was a little ass kid, uh-huh. and he was playing at a club called Mr. J's that was on Crenshaw and Imperial. You know what I'm saying? The Crenshaw and Imperial that which is like across the way is IVCs, other way is Watergate Crips. You know, check out Tupac history when it comes to IVC. Okay. And corrupt with a guy named Mental Marcel okay. that taught everybody how to rap over there at Inglewood. Okay. And then it was the Water Gates over there. That 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 village over there. You know, uh, DJ Pool, all them. Mm-hmm. It's like, but all these are high level art communities that society said was fucked up. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to get to mm-hmm. with this whole shit. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my mom called my father cheating in this area. Okay. Because <laughs> we lived over here. Man, I remember, I remember seeing seeing her going to the nightclub. You heard the jazz playing. Ding, 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 ding. You were in the car? I was in the car. She said, wait in the car oh, right God. here. She parked in the front, and she, you know, and the door opened to the club. You hear like, and you're drunk. All of a sudden, you're like, and, 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 ah, motherfuckers running out. You see my mom got my dad by the jacket pulling that motherfucker out. He's trying to find you. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm driving on the car, but as this is going, the band is still playing. Wow. And it's this intense music still playing. And they tripping in the parking lot. And I'm just there like, but these are my first experiences with music, mm-hmm. with my father. Like, everything is, it's like all grouped together, you know? Some yeah, man. Um, in your senior year, your father entered rehab in New York City, right? And mm-hmm. so you and your mother were now not, he wasn't around for this part of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, what sacrifices did your mother, who was a singer, or is a singer, mm-hmm. um, make as a young, I can imagine, a young black woman in Crenshaw? Um, she made the ultimate sacrifice because she had her own dreams. Mm-hmm. You know, she came to L.A. from Bakersfield, California. Mm-hmm. So she had her own dreams of a songwriter and singer. And, you know... When when she got into a relationship with my dad, and they had me, everything was going smooth to me. But it's it's hard, mm-hmm. it's hard. And as as we know, as fathers and lovers, and it's it's hard as fuck. You know, it's hard. And that was a different time. You know, her sacrifices is is, is you know, I she she put her whole dream to the side. You know, because she said, yo, I, I got. It. She told me young. She's like, yo, your, your dad's amazing, but I had you, you mine, we're going to do it like this. Because she told me, I, I, your dad is great, but I don't want you to see him like this. Because mm-hmm. it, it, it started getting a little a little worse, but he always still fucked with me. Like, mm-hmm. I was with my dad on all the missions, though. Mm-hmm. High-speed chase, tripping on, coming, walking from school, him tripping on some the hood, the, and then pulling the gun out, about to kill somebody from the hood in front of me. Like, all these different things I grew up. Mm-hmm. When he go home, he, he throwing on John Coltrane. Wow. He throwing on Sonny Stitt. He throwing on Woody Shaw. He throwing on all that. And my mom is like, just, oh, this dude is crazy, you know. But uh, the sacrifice that she had to make was, like, tremendous because she had to figure out how to, how to raise a young man in the hype of the gangbang in the crack era mm-hmm. when everything was influencing me. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I wasn't a walk-in-the-park kid. You know, I, 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 I struggled with the system early, mm-hmm. gunplay early, getting caught with cases, fraud, all kind of, like, you know, my up until I would say, Last time I went to jail, like 22 years old. So that was my last time I went to jail, and I was like, man, I can't come back to jail. I felt like I was going to jail every weekend, but I got lost in the system for some bullshit. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, they, that was in that motherfucker for a few months, and I was like, okay, dog, man. Because mm. I'm in it with some dudes that really is dealt with a different hand. They don't have the ability to play the saxophone, mm-hmm. piano. They can't read music. They, can't, they, they don't have these tools. Mm-hmm. And, you know, man, uh, 
a, a lot of homies in jail was getting at me on this one trip, like, because I, I knew when I went to jail, they were, you know, why, why are you in here? I'm, some bullshit, you know. But, you know, I cats told me in there, like, Bro, you have a you have a gift. You yeah. play, yeah. You play jazz, like, right. What you doing in here? Because because they they was quest what I they look so strange what I'm doing in there because white America erased the legacy, put that shit in college and made it watered down. But yeah, honestly, the tradition I grew up in is the real jazz shit. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I grew up in the shit. Yeah, the real jazz shit. Like I, I like I, I I don't play to get no motherfucking accolade because mm-hmm. I don't get no accolades when I play. Mm-hmm. You know, 90% of the gigs I played, the horn cost more than the fucking gig. Right. Even to this day. Right. That's a so, word right there. You know, bro. I don't, I don't, so my, mm. my thing is I played. The horn costs more than the fucking gig. Yeah, you feel me? I didn't even think about that. Horns are expensive yeah. AF. Yeah. When you talk about watered down jazz, when you watch all of the older movies, is it, I think it's called Sophie's Love with that just came out with Tessa or mm-hmm. Tess, whatever. In almost every one of those movies, they always like, you cannot date a jazz player, like jazz mm-hmm. player, jazz player. Yeah, mama player. said don't marry no bluesman. Or no yeah, jazzman. and it's like, but you, when you get to school and stuff, it's like the white people in high school are the ones playing jazz, so you don't even realize that. Well, I mean, that phrase would would translate into just don't marry someone who's doing the popular music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That phrase yes, was, was, yes. was created when jazz and blues was the pop music. Yes. It's like that now your mother be like, don't date no rapper. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. It changed well, you know what? I, I think that all comes from people just getting this perception of, you know, of different, you know, multiple women and different things like that. As road if life, you, as if, but you man, fuck that. As if you can't be a truck driver and your all husband go off cheat. and drive they trucks and he fucking with women. every dispatcher, or your wife drive trucks, she fucking with every dispatcher. That that's some bullshit. It's the same shit everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, you gotta fuck with somebody and trust them. But yeah, that that whole stigmatism of the whole jazz cat is the cheater, the the drug, the this. That's some bullshit. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like like because. That what they saying is the highlight of that. That's human being shit. Mm-hmm. Yes, just the artists huh. live more of an honest life. Yeah, right. so it's easier to be like you can say that. Yeah, they dumb honest motherfuckers over there. Don't yeah. fuck stay with away them. from them. <laughs> um, I want to ask about uh, your the Martin family trio, but before that, tell me. I mean, one, one of my girlfriends said- cheated on me with a snake breeder. Your girlfriend cheated on you with a snake breeder? My old girlfriend back in the day. She cheated on I had her. She cheated with a snake breeder. I'm just saying to stay right, like. So don't fuck with snake don't breeders. Don't fuck with snake breeders. You stay away so from them will, snakes. They will take you. They will take you later. But watching Snowfall, I mean, I've always heard about the crack era, but I learned a lot about the crack era from Snowfall because I didn't know how bad it was. I didn't I knew that, you know, the government put it in the system, but I didn't really understand mm. like how they really set the black community up to fail yeah. until I watched that show. So hearing you talk about it, it literally just yeah. coexists. Uh, yo, yo, let me tell you something. It ain't it ain't been no epidemic like crack. Mm-hmm. Get fuck what nobody say. This this is the drug that had everybody out on the street. Either you was on it or you was chasing somebody on it. Because yeah. you, you didn't understand that. You thought, people thought you could chase them, talk good to them, and bring them back home. This was some other shit. I, and I, you know, that the snowfall, first of all, I love snowfall. I absolutely and love snow, it. And snowfall, when I look at that, I, I got to stop looking at it. I, I cry sometimes. Because I remember these crazy murders with my cousins, my brothers, you know, my aunties. my You know, my family was deep in the dope game. So it's like these senseless, hard, you would hear about horrific murders, man. Like... Motherfuckers had to see this on TV, mm. you know, the black folks, and we we not that we we're not a barbaric people. They that's that should come from Scarface and all that shit. But you, it's like you, you when crack came in, it is to me. I'm still I'm traumatized. I'm still affected by that. Even how I act, like Rob always say, man, you a little rough when we go to every. I'm like, nah, I'm not rough. I'm aware, Brody. Mm. Mm. Yeah. My reality, I didn't grow up in an art community. Mm-hmm. I grew up in South Central. I had a couple of artists in it. So it's like now, nah, my, my, you know, the, the the crack era is still, you 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 still see the rhythms of that. I mean, just like I say, I always say when you when you mention crack to me, I can't mention crack without talking about the level of guns we start seeing on the streets. Yeah, yeah. And that's when it was like, and then the people had never seen that kind of money because mm-hmm. they starve us out for so motherfucking long. So we never seen that kind of money. So it made people really go. Everybody was affected. People say, no, my family wasn't on it. Yeah, but if you had somebody sell it, this somebody was affected by crack. You yeah. know, and it wasn't just LA. No. You know, but that, 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 my story is LA, that's where I come from. But when I went to New York and visited my aunties and uncles, 
it was dark there too. Same shit. I remember walking to school, and you could not walk to school without stepping on several crack vials at one point. Now that that's New York, yeah. Like a mother, now that's that's where it's different. That's New York, yeah. Because we was walking everywhere. Man, yeah. yeah. And that when they I used to go visit, I used to be like, "What the fuck?" Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it was that that was the that sound, shit, yeah. Throughout. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the Martin family trio and with your father and Larry Goldings. Um, are you guys ever gonna make any more music? Yeah, yeah. We uh, the Martin family trio with Larry. First of all, Larry Goldings been like a hero of me mm -hmm. and Robert Glasper yeah. for like. I mean, he's he's so hip, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, and my dad loves Larry because my dad's a drummer that loves organ players. So when we did, we 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 recorded like twenty songs. We did like we did New York for a week and the Blue Note recorded. Right. It was cool. It was and it's fun. And it's fun because I I for my dad and the, the, the jazz thing, I take off everything and do that because my dream has always been just to like yo let me make sure I uplift this dude because my mom and yeah. him was like like really on me even through my dad through crack he was still like you practicing clapping count sheets mm. this and that. Okay, he likes hip hop. I can't afford this, but I'm gonna get him this. My mom, well, this costs this, blah blah, because she a L.A. mama, so it's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the call it, he an art daddy, it, L.A. Right. mama, uh, yeah, art, <laughs> you know. But I was there hitting my, but my mom taught me responsibility. My mom taught me it's two words in music business, music and business. Business is the biggest word. My mom is the one that said, that's good. You learn all that Charlie Parker stuff. You better play the motherfucking keyboard, though, because all keyboard players work. And you wow. got to pay motherfucking bills. So if you're going right. to do this art business. shit, you better make it a business. My dad was like, fuck that. You better learn all the changes. This is, right. So it was the beautiful part of both. Like my mom, my mom, <laughs> my mom I, I like to call her the gentle, shallow side of music. And my father's 100% art. My mom is the one that kept that shit on the straight and narrow. That's why you need women. Yeah. Oh, you what? You you need women. Hmm. You know? Your pops once told you that your horn is your gun to bring it everywhere you go. I heard you talking about how having that horn gave you an identity, especially riding public transportation in Los Angeles. And for people outside of Los Angeles, the first thing that you're told when you get here is don't take public transportation. You grew up on it, and yeah. you're riding it with this horn. So can you share some of those experiences with us? What makes public transportation interesting in L.A., mm -hmm. especially when you're from L.A., is that L.A. is so, especially in South Central L.A., it's, it's, that 212? it's, mm -hmm. it's so many hoods. Mm -hmm. So the bus is going through every hood. So if you go to a school out your district, you got to cross through different hoods. Right, right, right. And those kids are getting on the bus too. You know what I'm saying? And if, mm -hmm. if, if, you, ain't, if you ain't one of the guys with the shit mm -hmm. or you got a crew, you lunch meat. You know, so every day I would be on the bus with a bunch of lunch meat, needless to say, cats around. You know, this is, you know, and every day cats would be getting jacked, beat up, everything took. But every time the cats would get to me, um, if it wasn't from Crenshaw and Slauson kind of down to anywhere over there, I was cool. But when it started crossing over to different places, uh, different gangs on the bus that maybe didn't like where I came from or or knew that this bus was coming from this zone. So these guys going to be on the bus, and you know. So, But every time I got on the bus, man, when I started playing the saxophone, mm. <laughs> before then it was like, shit, I had to stab somebody in the fucking neck if it go down. Mm -hmm. I, I got to get home. I'm not mm -hmm. going to. I grew up where I'm not going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm going home mm -hmm. by any means necessary, you know. And ho thank God nothing happened to me with that mentality because I was kind of overweight with asthma, so I probably would have been much of a component to battle. But needless to say, when I start playing the horn, cats would come over and you know they hit the dude next. Man, give me your shit, give me your, give me your shoes, give me your this, and they see me like, uh oh, you fuck with the music? I'd be like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 not on the like, yeah, because I wasn't a buster. Right. But I'd be like, because you can't be like that where I come from. Mm -hmm. Even if your heart is like that. My heart was probably like, but my face was probably like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, because I can't let it get back to the homies that I let this happen anyway. But every time I get to that, they be like, Phew. get the dude next to me. And every I'd be like, Phew. For years, and that's what happened in my life. You know, with mm -hmm. that, that's that's that ended up being a, a your lyricist. What's those things that end up 
a, like a blanket statement for my whole end up. My life is based off the horn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of walking through without people fucking with me. You it's know like a I'm metaphor saying? for your life or a represent sim- symbol of your yeah, life. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. So the horn has always been that. The horn is how I got to Snoop, how I got to everybody. Mm. Yeah, man. You know. Um, I just found out because I just found out Problem, who I love Problem, found out that his name was Martin. Mm-hmm. And then I Googled and I seen a child of cousins. Mm-hmm. So definitely shout out to Problem. Um, you're also cousins with Thundercat, right? Mm-hmm. How does this happen? We all black. <laughs> and Christian Scott, my good friend. Uh, shout out to Christian Scott. He taught me uh, something called an ancestral recall. Oh, yeah. that He be on that type of shit. He, and it's re- he real. He real with that shit. It's real, bro. He'll have you doing some. Oh, uh, it's real. Yeah. It's the level. So I started mm-hmm. diving into it. Not as deep as he into it, but... but <laughs> Shout out I, to Christian. I credit everybody being on some type of one accord mm-hmm. to just that. You know, I, I you know, because when you think about problem, his mom, his dad, they don't play music. Mm-hmm. His grandparents don't play music. But he's a musical motherfucker. Yeah, he is. You know what I'm saying? You, I you, met him at Knife Wonder Studio. Yeah. So you, yeah. that, that, and he has an ear for R&B, mm-hmm. hip hop, different things. You know what I'm saying? But that, he's from Compton. Some with that soil in Compton. You mm-hmm. know, Compton, Compton don't produce no slackers. Right. It ain't one artist from Compton I met, whether they're famous or not. I ain't met one whack artist that can't make the earth shake from Compton. Mm-hmm. I just haven't met one. Just like from That's Queens. praise. Or from Brooklyn. Yeah, I met yeah. so certain places, no disrespect to nobody else, but for me personally, that I've worked with artists, it's certain cities, foundation, because I, I think that's bigger than music. Mm-hmm. If you, you saying hello, you saying excuse me. So I, I think p- people that's from these places that that birth these these things are just special, and he's one of those guys, along with Kendrick and everybody else. You know what's crazy also about Problem is that when I went to look to do the research, and like, this just hit me, my name is in his Wikipedia. Oh. Wow. In the first paragraph. And it says, problem got on, I'm paraphrasing, but it says problem got on because he helped Terrence Martin with this record, Be Thankful, which is a fantastic record, yeah. by the way. Yeah. And it says the record was n- seen as notable by Snoop Dogg and Talib Kweli. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm part of Problem's story and I don't even know it. Oh, yeah. And you involved in that. Oh, yeah. Well, you 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 part of his story and my story because way before we met you, we was already studying. You. Mm-hmm. We're, 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 we, we're addicted to learning. We're addicted to studying. We're addicted to being like, what what can we learn? So we mm-hmm. when I remember, I, I, I know it's Black Star, but where I come from, what really had an impact in the ghetto for us was quietly... Right. Mm. Boo-boo-doo, boo-boo-doo. That record did very well for me in LA. That record, I had to hear that record to then go back to Black Star mm-hmm. and know what where, where this guy and this producer, where did they come from? Because, you know, and then Snoop got on the remix. Yeah, Snoop was on uh Oh no 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 no! I get I, no. He's on, what, what remix was he he's on? He's on Get By remix. Get By remix. But Snoop was on. Now that, right. He was on the beat with a radio show, and so was Quick. Yeah, and so Snoop and Quick, and then you got the guys on Friday Night Flavors, Fuzzy yeah. and 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 that record, bro, yeah, Fuzzy and Chalk and and the Beat Junkies, the L.A. radio dudes was playing that record. It was L.A. and it was Big Vaughn in the Bay Area, KMEL, but it wasn't New York. Wow. New York wasn't on that. That record was big out here, bro. big in L.A. No, that record was yeah. like, like that was the one record that snuck in because that was that was. Battle Cat, Snoopy's era, Dre. That was the yeah. one record that introduced, if I'm not mistaken, the high tech sound. To That's us right. Too. But it, it equally the high tech sound with the quali thing. Yeah. Because that was all you, mm-hmm. and you, you was swag. Dude, in the, we we West Coast, so we close to Detroit, which is funk, which is mm-hmm. bass lines, mm-hmm. Motown. Yeah, and you that know, West Coast. A lot of Quincy that West Jones Coast sound told, is Quincy Jones told me straight West up. Funk. Quincy Jones told me straight up backstage Letterman show. He told me in my face. Fender sent a couple of Fender Jazz basses to him and Motown. It, if it wasn't for a Fender bass, it would be no hip hop. Mm. I believe that. <sighs> and that because a lot of elements Motown. in this. Come too. on, man. That's got to be one. So of them. going back to mm-hmm. them bass lines and what you bu- and that bass line is the sample is Heat Wave, which is an Ohio group. Midwest, Which I te- though. Tapped into that. Well, yeah. 
And guess what? So that we did, we didn't know that then. Mm-hmm. We just thought it was you and I, and I Tech, you mm-hmm. know. And that that record really, we felt like you were our cousin because it felt so it felt so just gangster like. It felt so hard that you you was, I don't I, I don't know how New York looked at you, but out here. Mm-hmm. He was one of the guys. Like that guy <laughs> with the Quali. Oh, that's what we doing. Yeah. What was the, what's the actual name of that song? Because I just call it Quali. The is Blast. It? The Black. Okay, because somebody yeah, asked that's someone good. was like, that's my favorite song from Taliban. I was like, I don't know that song. And it's then they played it. I was like, oh, classic. I know that's Quali. The blast. That's the it's name of that. <laughs> right. For sure. I love it. I know you went to USC. We talked about that earlier. But before that, you went to Cal Arts and you left Cal Arts to join Diddy's gospel group. Um, God's property. What was that experience like, and wh- what was that experience like, and what made you decide that at that time school was not for you? Diddy came to my life when I was seventeen, my junior year of high school. We just me and him just talked about it. We we always talk about this moment. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Uh, he was he, D- Diddy came to my life through. It was my junior year of high school, and it was an interesting year because that was that was the year also. You know, Pocket died the year before. Biggie died. It was East Coast, West Coast was like at its. Mm-hmm. It was like high. And, you know, I was I was in high school, but I was doing sessions, so I knew what was going on on the streets. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, I remember, I remember driving right, right, twenty minutes after Biggie got killed when the scene was. I was driving down Fairfax to get to Lamert to go play with Billy Higgins that night. That was in March. I never will forget. That was in March. What the fuck happened? You no know, internet, so you know, mm-hmm. on the radio, mm-hmm. just silent. Yeah. We just, you know what I'm saying? But Puff, and this was like a year after that. Now, mind you, I'm I'm a Biggie fanatic and a Puff, and you know, production, the hitman and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a death row cult follower, though. Like, <laughs> man. Yeah. What? Snoop? <laughs> Dre? Right. Dog Pound? Suge? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then Bad Boy. I mean, I, I'm from LA, so at that time, Bad Boy was was was. I, I was my friends was more or less playing Bad Boy, but I was playing it. I was playing Biggie album, but but so I was I was inspired, but not really until high school. I, uh, I got a call to go to the office, and it was my godmother Shirley Madison, which is Coy Madison's mother. She was she was in the industry young. She always put us with everybody, and and you know Shirley said, "Hey, hey Puffy doing something in L.A. at the Shrine Auditorium, Soul Train Music Awards. They need a baritone saxophone player. You play baritone? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I play baritone. Yeah, yeah. I can borrow Barry from school. Well, Puffy, at that time, Puffy, you know they doing all about the Benjamins. Can you you know you want to do this? They got charts." You know, I think it'd be a good look for you. She was always ahead with mm. with getting young people into place. Shirley Madison. Shouts out to Shirley Madison. Uh, and um, yeah, I said, yeah. So I did school, which I was a pro at doing. Anyway. <laughs> I lived too. Well, I, was, I just got in my car and, yeah. and I was driving. So I just got in my, I walked to the teacher parking lot. I was parking the teacher parking lot. Got in my car. I grabbed the homie's horn, went down to the rehearsal. Strong Auditorium. And this was the first time. This whole week was crazy, bro. This was a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So I get to the Strong Auditorium. I get in. I see Puff and everybody walk past. Lil' Kim. Right. Lil' C- Fucks me up. First time seeing stars. Fuck. Like, wow. Right. Looked like they was gliding across the back. <laughs> like, you know. Like, it. You know, Lil' Kim looked gorgeous, yeah. man. And, and Puff just looked vibrant, but right. you know, you know, it was, it, you know, he looked like he had a mission. Right. And you know, and we went to that stage, and I had my horn. I didn't talk much. I had my horn, took it out, and we had the charge. It was all all about the business that just came out, and it was the rehearsal. And I remember just seeing him rehearsing about twelve different times, and me saying like, "Man, I didn't know that rich people." Rehearsed this much. Worked so hard, right? Worked so hard, right? And he was doing that, you know, and it fucked me up. And that was the first time I, I saw that. And then, uh, uh, I missed my graduation, you know, because the show happened to be on the day of my graduation. That same week on a Thursday, 
I got called to do a session by one of my mentors on saxophone named Kenneth Crouch. Him and his brother Keith Crouch. They produced like Brandy, mm -hmm. CC Wine, all these albums. They called me to the studio, Studio 56. And I went, walked into the studio, and this is the first time I saw Snoop Dogg. Mm. And Snoop Dogg was in transition of going to No Limit, but it was no internet, so nobody knew. I remember him having the braids, but they wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And just it was just like looking grimy, looking hood, like grimy. And then corrupt being right there. And then me seeing like, what the fuck? But I just saw Puff. And, and me, this week was like... <laughs> And I right. was in high school, and right. I was 11th, 11th, 12th grade. 12th, one of these, but I was just like, I ain't got no money, but I feel so rich. Mm -hmm. mm. I feel so yeah. fulfilled. I saw Puff, and he looked big ass chain. Snoop, Snoop was looking so just, just like the ultimate crib to me, like the low, like right. you know, just no jury, but just like. It looked like he was ready for whatever. And that was big to me in, in that light. And then Corrupt, he had, Corrupt had on blue 501s, a blue t-shirt, white t-shirt under that, a very clean Laker jacket, blue Nike Cortez, white clean laces, perfect haircut. And was, wow. And was sitting like this and was brushing his hair like this. And his waves back then, the way, he probably still got waves there. Young Gotti. Back then, Young Gotti, <laughs> the waves like this. And for me, growing up back and forth in New York and being a young MC, the MC element was so deep in me. And the jazz, and when I saw Corrupt, I damn near threw up. Because back then I was like, he the only one we got that could stand up to a lot of these motherfuckers. <laughs> I was, because I was on With the- With the intellect of Wizards and Warlocks. And he was just, you know, he was gaudy. Mm. And then you saw Snoop. Warren G was there that night too. And it was just like, wow. and then that day, because back then you had two or three rehearsals for award shows, you, you know, mm -hmm. that era. Mm -hmm. And then that day I did Soul Train. And then that day at Soul Train Awards when I met Kirk Franklin- a guy named Robert Spud C. Wright that produced the God's Property album in God's Property. And then I went to college that next year, and then Spud called me to go on the road with Kirk Franklin, God's mm. Property. Then I left school and went with God's Property. That's how that, that thing went, you know. But I was lying to my mom saying I was in school the whole time. What? It's like some Sister Act 2 stuff. Oh, yeah, I was, I was gone. I was on the road, man. I was like, man, fuck this school shit, man. <laughs> I'm out of here. Got to follow your dreams. Now, speaking of Snoop, obviously you being where you from, Seeing him in that moment had to be huge for him and having him in your life. You've mentioned Snoop several times in this interview. Mm -hmm. So I could tell, and I know you have a very special relationship with him. Your song, Let's Go Get Stone, is a blues song about weed. Mm -hmm. Where Snoop is singing. Also singing on I'm For Real. So what is it, what is it about your tracks that make him turn into a singer? You know what? I, you know, it, <laughs> Snoop, is, Snoop is my master teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and people, you know, he, he's like Quincy Jones is a master teacher. Right. Yourself, you're a master teacher. Dilla, master teacher. Like he's, you know, Snoop is a Snoop is actually a master teacher of all of us, though. You know, if we can sustain. Yeah, that's my OG too, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, my OG. So it's like it's yeah. all these it's yeah. layers, but in, in, it all it all comes down from Snoopy. But Snoop Snoop is like. For me personally, first of all, when I was 13, I saw him on Deep Cover. My mom told me, if you want to get something, you better pray for it. So I prayed to work with Snoop Dogg mm. and Dr. Right. I, I prayed to God at 13 before I even knew who they was. God, please, if you could grant me, because I was doing beats then. I wasn't playing the horn. If you could grant me the opportunity to just do a, do a beat for him, mm. I love it. I love it. So by, by the time, I tell Snoop all the time, I, I was built to work with Snoop. Mm hmm you know, but I, I know Snoop better than whoever know me because I didn't study him before he knew me. Right. As a kid, you know, he was like a father, big brother figure from a video on radio standpoint yeah, yeah, <laughs> before yeah. I even knew him. So by the time I got to him, I was well studied on, on the man I was getting prepared to work for. And, you know, and he was also getting prepared to teach me. You know, he's my biggest, mm -hmm. next to my father and my mother, he, he's my biggest teacher in my, my life, life, being a father investments, music, loving mm -hmm. different people, different music. Uh, uh, if you could, if, if you could mm -hmm. squash a beef and move on with love, move on with love. Make your hardest effort to move on with love. Yeah. If you can't, stay away. If they keep fucking with you, destroy it. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are, these are lessons that Snoop installed in me. And to really love is the biggest lesson and to keep your ears open. Like, you know, uh, Snoop has just taught me so much, man, at a yeah. young age. And, and when you say arm music like that, these are records he turned me on to. Mm -hmm. I didn't know much about Ray Charles till Snoop. 
I didn't know that song. That was that's a Ray Charles song he redid. I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't, you know, the I'm for real. That that song he wanted to do. Yeah. So he taught me these songs, and I just had the musical ability to play these songs. He taught me though. He taught me about blue magic, the dramatics, the importance of the temptations, the importance of Cool Heart, the importance of Queens, the importance of Brooklyn, the importance of Atlanta, the importance of Gucci Man, the importance of your children, the importance of eating right, the importance of branding, the importance importance of don't be a one trick pony Mm -hmm. you know do different things play different music the only kind of music is good and bad that's so crazy so he's he's the teacher and he's he's the teacher of teaching me how to tame things like back then my desire was just to crip period he taught me that's cool but there's some other things that's gonna help you live Mm. And take care of your mama and your kids. And he he taught me some secret passageways to life that I, I always love him for. And I, I I talk to Snoop once. It's not a, a week that go by I don't talk to Snoop. If I miss him, we send each other messages. And I tell him I tell him I tell him only I tell him every time since we I started this ride with him in the late nineties. I love you. I value you, and I appreciate you to the highest level. Like he's. Without him, it wouldn't be me connected to a Quincy. Without without me, it wouldn't be me connected to a Dot or anything. You know, mm-hmm. he's like the root yeah. of me because for me, I was the closest they could get to him. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? But I was in the streets. He's an icon. He let me creep in. Yeah. And when he let me creep in, problem. Rocks. Every, every, let's, 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 you know, Snoop, Snoop lovers, let's go. And so it's like, you know, Snoop has always been extremely supportive of, of whatever I do and what anybody does that's that's in the push of love and that's why I you know I I I I Snoop is an icon we'll never forget him mm-hmm. but as long if I can help it mm-hmm. I'll never I'll always remind them of the high level of iconic intelligence and black culture shifting this king is in all areas of music I think Snoop Dogg may be the most important hip hop artist I feel that. Yeah. I feel in that. In terms of global reach and what the culture represents and his transformation mm-hmm. um, and everything you said, yeah, man. Um, when you were just breaking down what he told you about good versus, good music versus bad, bad music, um, I was thinking about when we had Glasper on this show and he was talking about how for Black Radio he sold it as an R&B album because of the Grammy situation. I was also thinking about a quote I heard you say when you were talking about working with Glasper and then when you first started working with musicians like them, you were impressed by them doing hybrid music. But then as you got older, you stopped calling it hybrid music. You start calling it just music. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to see if you could break that down for us. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I've been on Rob since like 14, 15. Mm-hmm. So Rob, Rob has always been... I've loved acoustic music, love it, play it and everything. But Rob, when Rob moved to New York, he... He went all the way in. He embodied that. Mm-hmm. Me being from L.A., I embodied kind of th- th- the gumbo mentality of everything. Yeah. So Rob embodied that. So when when I when when Robert started developing this thing, uh, uh, him and Chris Dave, you know, um, Rob had an apartment. Robert and Brian Cox had an apartment in Brooklyn mm-hmm. that a lot of this shit was developed. I remember. That's when I met him. He was yeah. working with Bilal and Common. And yeah. The, that era. And him and Chris Dave was down there just... Look, stirring up the pot, stirring up the pot, getting mm-hmm. ready for the world and blow and everything. So Robert was already uh, way ahead on what 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 would be what things that we do now as far as really blending the jazz with the hip hop and R and B shit, but making it cool because a lot of folks tried. You hear me? A lot of people tried, and I remember young being so involved with gangster shit mm-hmm. and loving jazz with my dad. Like I felt like every attempt. Other than Tribe Called Quest, every attempt was corny to me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We ain't got to name the name because people get... Oh, oh, I'm, t- I'm talking about my opinion. Yeah. Everything was corny until Tip and them dudes got involved. Even when it was tried by other jazz musicians and other rap producers, they, people would come together, but it would always feel like the jazz guy came and got the hip-hop guy because that's new. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It, it never felt like they both was eating at the same table, the music. To me, until Tribe came in, you know. What and, you just said gets said a lot on this show. Yeah. In relation to Tribe and jazz. Yeah. And how Tribe Called Quest was a portal for a lot of us oh, to appreciate jazz music. Tribe was it, bro. Yeah. 
No, everybody want to say and take claim and they did it before. And then. Fuck who did it before Tribe was the pinnacle of that mm-hmm. shit. Because my, my theory is with black music is it's easy to make music. Let's, let's talk about art. Mm-hmm. All right? Talk about art. It's easy to make high level art that you and six of your friends mm-hmm. like. To make some high level unapologetic black shit that the world like? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sheesh. And hit records? Tribe Called Quest. So right. they penetrated the ghetto. Yeah. yeah. All that deep shit didn't yeah. penetrate where I was from. Yeah. They, the low end theory penetrated. When you look, when you look and check the rhyme on the vinyl, who those who could find the original vinyls, look at how long that groove is. Look at how when when big and we in Culver City right now, mm-hmm. big boy from Power 106. Shout out to Big Boy. Shout out to the big first boy. time I heard Tribe Called Quest and checked the rhyme, I was in seventh grade at Culver City Middle School, right in right by the cafeteria. It was me and my friend Damian Carter, which is named Slossy Yaniga, a very well known okay. Los Angeles photographer, and Big Boy and DJ Ray was playing MC Brains. Mm-hmm. Uchi Kuchi La La La. Juice soundtrack. Uh-huh. And Lord after Lynch. that, they kept going do, 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 Right. Do, 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 do. And we was like, what the fuck? Right. And what the and then when it came, boom, me and Damian Corris lost, we was like, oh fuck! What is th-? we had never right. heard nothing like this. I felt the same way when I heard that record. It fucked us up, yeah. Wally. It fucked us up, way. Brody. And we was so fucked up. We was, the whole week, we was like, we can't wait till they play that song again. Then, mm-hmm. then it came out. Because Big Boy always had his shit and him and DJ Ray before it came out. Mm-hmm. And it came, and then that shit. But I wasn't playing jazz then. Mm-hmm. I was just a fan, which mm-hmm. is the real traditional fly shit. I was in golf. So by, by the time I played jazz, the song that made me really go deep in jazz was Tribe Called Quest. Peace to the English, wherever you are, because it was Red Clay. Red, Red, Freddie Hubbard. And my but dad, that's not even the Freddie Hubbard version that he sampled. I know. But Freddie Hubbard got the best version. So my dad heard that and was like, that's motherfucking Freddie Hubbard, man. Right, right. That ain't nothing but Freddie Hubbard. That, so, that ain't nothing but Freddie Hubbard. So now <laughs> Tribe Called Quest gave something me and my dad could talk about. Right. Uh-huh. Right. Me and my mom couldn't even talk now. Because mm. she was gospel Loving uh, at the at the time Luther Vandross, BB and CC Whining, Gregory Haynes. Mm-hmm. Y'all young, y'all y'all, I'm a young motherfucker. Y'all look up Gregory Haynes. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Study. He had albums, yeah. dance, and act. High level black superheroes. She was on that. Everything love. When my dad got hit the Tri Call Quest, he started buying me Tri Call. Then he started buying me hip hop. He wouldn't have much money, mm. but he would buy me like Ice T, Ryan Pays. Mm. Tri Call Quest. He thought every hip hop was like that. Right. So he said, boom. And guess what? It was. Right. Mm-hmm. It was. So my dad was like, boom, and tried and just, and just, you know, that was the thing. So when I got with Robert was developing that, Robert was the first music, Robert and Chris Day were the first musicians. Because when they started was developing that, I was already producing records with Snoop. Mm-hmm. I was already full fledging with Battle Cat doing gangster shit and going to Dre video shoots and, right. you know, sharing at home and playing at night. Mm-hmm. But th- this was. And still, this was strictly for my spirit. This, this mm. that's I talked to God through the horn, mm. so I didn't give a fuck about who liked me or not. That was mm. how I talked to God every day from fucking with the other people. Relaxing. Mm-hmm. And I've heard you talk about how doing that type of music early in your career started to weigh heavy on your spirit. Oh yeah. So having yeah. the horn probably was help alleviate that. Yeah, because at, at, when I hit like mid twenties. My kids start getting older because I had kids young, like mm-hmm. 16. They start getting older. Yeah, I think you had kids when I met you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had kids every year you met me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we want to make sure there's a lot of Martins out here. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it got tricky because I was so involved with street shit, knowing shit, and that that coming of age happened, you know, mm-hmm. and the music got serious. Like I got deeper. At 24, I, I, got, I got deeper about what I was doing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing a lot of records, but I was also, most of my days was hanging with Billy Higgins, Cedar mm. Walton, Jack and McLean, and these guys mm. that were mm. influencing me on my jazz shit, but they would influence me as my spiritual shit. You know, yeah. it, it's a responsibility. You know, you're blessed to do what you do because the creator realized that you could deal with this responsibility. Yeah. So when I started getting involved in that, you know, we, you know, but at the time I was changing, Snoop was changing, everybody was changing too. So it wasn't just like I was. Everybody was changing, and you know, a lot of murders was happening, a lot of friends getting killed. And it just started getting scary to know that some of your music 
without saying too much was some of these things that were played why some of the, some of the most darkest things like you like like I have gangster classic records in my catalog which I love musically but some of the things that you know I've, I've heard different brothers that have, that 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 have had fallen uh sisters biological and brothers saying mm. you know this is what and the motherfuckers roll up playing you know this shit you know so and just knowing seeing my music going to different hood parties seeing what would happen when my music come on you know mm. seeing the the faces went to this to mm. and being like damn and saying like I accidentally flipped the switch. I didn't mean to do that, you know. Mm. But I, I was conscious of that, you know. I was, I didn't mean to, to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that all my music is preached. My music is honest music. Yeah. You know. Well, that's why I think you mesh so well with TDE and Kendrick. Yeah. Because I think they are the sort of rap counterpart to what you're doing. Not to say that you don't rap, because yeah. I enjoy yeah. you as a rapper too. But... You, well, I, I I didn't make it as a record quality, so it's right. it's okay. You I, 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 I didn't. Yeah, I, <laughs> I you know what? Let me funny real story is. I, my heart desire was to be an MC my whole life. I could tell. My my that was my heart desire, and and you have big MC energy. I, I, my, that's my heart <laughs> desire, and I was around all the MCs. Right, and and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I start seeing like people want me. They like they like my music, mm -hmm. and my reach is further with the music. And honestly. I'm around. The, I'm not as good as the guys I'm around. These are some bad motherfuckers, <laughs> and I respect that mic, right? That craft. I'm not. I don't come from the generation of every, everybody. So let me be. Everybody could do it because we own. <laughs> I don't come. What they I, do? So let me be. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't. And I, I'm not dissing them, but I, right. I don't come from the generation where. Hey, and God bless hip hop no, for being did. able to do this. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I just don't come from the oh nothing worked out Tuesday. Let me rap Thursday. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't, I come from like, I got to work on this. I yeah. can't say that twice because I can't, whoa, ooh, that's the Brooklyn flow. Oh, I can't, ooh, no, but mm -hmm. Corrupt's going to. You study. I study, mm -hmm. and so, but I realized that studying with hip hop was my same thing with beats and everything. So then really, you know, I, I transferred my love for being an MC to like, uh, it wasn't working out. I didn't crack like I wanted to. I wanted to chain the women, the big house, mm -hmm. the fly, the videos. It didn't go like that. And I was like, damn, this is kind of hurtful. Well, let me crack over here because it's cracking too. And I went, boom. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I told myself that. Yeah. I wasn't the guy trying to figure it out. You're from LA because you have the LA accent, but you tell stories kind of like you're from New York because LA niggas are not as animated from what I've seen. And you're like very animated as if you're from the East Coast, but you sound nothing like you're from up there. You know what's deep though? What's deep? And this is this is the thank you, first of all. Um, when you when you really deal with Los Angeles natives though, like 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 you got to get Battle Cat on the show. Yeah, man, I have a lot of Once questions. Once you get Battle Cat, Cat you are gonna look at my animation like turned down. <laughs> <laughs> ba Battle Cat, he he know how to talk about a straw and the elements, how to make that straw and make you be like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm always with Herbie Hancock. Yeah, and he's Buddhist, and I've I've been taking on some of these things the past five six years, like just you know learning, kind of like dabbling and chanting different things like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I learned from him is you can find beauty within every problem. Mm -hmm. And I I take that I think about when I was young for like ten fifteen years, trying to be a professional MC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and wanting to be a star, wanting to be. A, a star MC, mad when people, my friends took me off a song or they just kept the beat or when I read write-ups, it's just the beat. Yeah. Like that. And I would get so hurt and so frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then after after I got with Herbie, I, I looked back at that and I said, wow. If I wouldn't have went through the art of becoming an MC, whether I may or not is one thing, mm -hmm. but going through the art yeah. and going through the thing, that has helped me feed my family. That's how come I'm so able to work with the best MCs mm. and they listen to me because I've went through the proper channels of studying the art of rhyme, studying under corrupt, studying what is what, knowing why that guy's special, knowing why Pimp C is amazing. Yeah. Knowing why that is like, you know, corrupt. And he's a and and I always believe a real MC finds the beauty in every MC. That's corrupt, right. Corrupt. I mean, when I was, you know, this is, you know, I used to be like, man, why are you like, he'd be like, cuz, you didn't hear what he said? 
the car went that way. My gun went that way. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> but he would, he would make these bars and yeah. then. But, but he guess did what? That on the show. Yes, we, yeah. we were talking about that beforehand. Yeah. And like everybody thinks it's his favorite. He's like, have you heard this guy? <laughs> right. You know. And you look at corrupt, and he's one of my teachers too, with that same Herbie Hancock mentality. You can find beauty within everything because he. You know, but not not becoming an MC how I wanted to be was really fucking with me. Yeah. You know, for years until I really said, "Well, wait a minute, I know some of the things I didn't do that I should have done. Let me make sure that guy has mm. those things. Mm. Let me make sure she has those things. Even if they want me for one song, they they could fire me or hire me for this record. But they're gonna if they usually I only get called for the cast that really want to be something for mm. real." You know, I think my last, my uh, uh, one of my challenging artists that I work with that I'm so proud of that we we went through that and it, it came out beautiful was a young lady, which is my one of my favorite MCs in general. Well, I, you know, Rap City, yeah, but Dreezy. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, my um my friend does her makeup. Yeah, so I, I work with Dreezy on her first album. My boy Rod, shout out to Rod. You know what I'm saying? Rod was one of the the, the young geniuses that I met through YG. Mm-hmm. You know. And uh, he said, you know, man, I'm, I'm going to be an a and I'm going to get a job. And I'm, on the back, I went on YG's tour, My Crazy Life, because I did yeah. that record with Mustard. Yeah. And I was the only guy with me and Mustard, and I was like, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> but Rob was one of the guys I met through YG that was right. like, yo, man, he was a good kid. He was like, yo, I'm going to get an A&R job one day. And back then, I was so fucked up. I was like, yeah, whatever, whatever. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Call me. I got you, bro. When you get the job, call mm-hmm. me. You know, thinking whatever. And he ended up getting a, a good situation at Interscope. And he mm-hmm. said, at Interscope, I got two artists. Aaron Ray, which is my little brother. He changed my life musically. Mm-hmm. Aaron Ray's a young musical genius. Mm-hmm. And then an artist named Treasy. Now, I'm, back then, I was like, man, I want to work with everybody. But I committed to Rod that I would work with okay. anybody to bring in. Okay. And Treasy was one of the artists. I walk in with Treasy, right? Interscope Studio. That's where I did all the records back then. The Tip of a Butterfly. Anything I did, you Interscope. And mm-hmm. she was all Interscope. So uh, usually my when I work with an artist, we talk about old music we like. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's younger than me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like young, younger. Like, you know. So I asked her, I said, oh, yo, she did something. I said, oh, that reminds me of Prince. She's like, who? What? Right. You can't do what? It gets deep. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. This this is a child. She mm-hmm. is young, yeah. No, no, this is a child. And my first response was, but but well, by then I I had already learned not to do the what. Yeah, I learned yeah. that because that's that excuse my language. This this, this ain't true. Right. That's old nigga shit though. Right. You oh know what no. I'm, saying? Yeah. I'm not saying you that. I'm just saying that's old nigga shit. But I had learned that from working that with. Shit came back from you. Uh, I did calling that girl old at roast battle. It's it karma. Just, it just it's came karma. back. So, just, <laughs> so here we go. So because you know why? Because I work with Y. They taught YG and them taught me don't do old nigga shit. Oh. Right. They taught me how to be acceptable for younger artists. YG mm-hmm. and them taught me that because I couldn't be like, oh, that ain't nothing but oh, that's that. That ain't nothing. Oh, I heard that. that. Yeah. Everything was new to me with them. Yeah. You know. So when when Dreezy did that, I said, my eyes went up but like that little bit. But instead of me taking like she don't she don't know, I said, "What can I learn from her then? Um, what can I learn? Because where does she come? From? What, right. Where was? Where what does, does she know that I don't know? Where does her musical palette? And she said, "Oh, yeah, my mom played Prince, but you know, but I, you know, <laughs> but her melody sounded like Prince Michael, and her MC shit was raw, and she was on the mic, and and she was this young girl that if you, uh, another person said she don't know about Prince." But then she said, well, let me show you what I know about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she took me to the back, and she had her whole album, what she wanted, and vision she wanted, how she grew up written out. Mm. And I said, well, I got to learn with Dreezy. Vision board shit. Yeah. So yeah. Dreezy was one of my, she probably don't even know, but she was one of my teachers. Wow. Because I said, I have to make her smile musically, because she don't grow with the same music I grow with. So how can I make this challenge? How can I overcome this child of making this young Chicago queen that's highly respected, how can I make her fuck with me? Another Chicagoan. And then I got, I did some music, and she, she went in on, and I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> and we came to a common ground. You know, yeah. it was through music, but I, you know, that was, that was, that was one of those, that was, that was, one, that was a testing moment, though. It's a we, great story, yeah, man. She, yeah, she that was definitely so, lit, That's though. a great story. Shouts out to Dreezy. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely shouts out to Dreezy. Yeah, so you mentioned just now 
to Pimp a Butterfly. And that's not the only TDE or Kendrick record you've worked on, but your fingerprints were heavy on that record. Um, For Free, King Kunta, These Walls, Complexion, Black of the Berry, You Ain't Gotta Lie. Um, you did track five on Untitled. You did Loyalty on Damn. So you are have your your imprint deep, deep, deep in those Kendrick albums in those Kendrick years. Tell me what you learned from that era. Kendrick is another one of my... Everybody I learned from at this party you talking about was way younger than me. Mm-hmm. Kendrick, Kendrick was one of the guys that... that I remember early, it was like I, I was a teacher. Mm-hmm. In between that, he became a teacher, you know. Him, mm-hmm. you know, and you know the to Pippa Butterfly experience. What it was, it was Kendrick is the artist and the name, but it, it was, it was, it was like you know, like Punch was heavy in that. Okay, as well, you know. Okay, but I also feel like musically, it feels like it was inspired by Three Chord Fold. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I was working on Three Chord Fold when we was doing Good Kid, Matt City. Right. You know what I'm saying? And and I bought a Punch name for the reason of. Punch is the glue that glues everybody together. Mm-hmm. He's the one that came and got me. He's the one that came and got Soundwave. He's, he's a producer. He's he is, producing. He produces producers. Producing. Mm-hmm. Punch is a master of producing producers. Punch is also a master of making. If, if you if you have a dream that's kind of cloudy, mm-hmm. he comes in with a special rag and wipe off the cloud and you can mm. get to it. You know, so. Every good artist needs somebody like that oh, in the corner. He's, man, yeah. he didn't. He didn't save me from going to jail, getting killed, a few different things, you know, mm. killing somebody. You know, he saved me from all different levels of life, you know. Mm-hmm. The, and that's what the, the TD thing is more, the, the at that time, the immediate crew was more family driven. You know, mm-hmm. I tell everybody, I mean, we were musically influenced by people, but we were more human being life influenced by mm-hmm. things. You know, that that was one of the rare records that was, we were pulling from different things, but it, the, the music we were pulling from was what, how do we, how do we provoke a feeling? Mm. It wasn't really let's try to sound like this, sound like it was how do we provoke a feeling? You know, people always credit the record to be, you know, it's it's a jazz thing, it's jazz. It's, but it's just it's some horn on it, and it's one song that you could consider jazz in that world. To me, is it feels like a black Disneyland. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and, and I think that's I think people would An like amusement to, park for the black mind. That's it. And we yeah. can't when you go to Disneyland. You you see all these different you see jazz and you know that's it, all these different things are in mm-hmm. under Disneyland's umbrella. I look at to pimp a butterfly like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. That's the first record I've done like that, and that's probably the last record I, I I'll do like that. That thing, you know, because yeah. that was a positively spiritual, draining, emotional for all of us. That was a real thing, and a lot of us had to grow up through that record. Wow. Mm. You know, we had to grow up by reading what the press was saying on that month. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. We, we from South Central and Compton and shit, so we don't really come from the... The academic way of looking man, at it. Man, fuck that. It's like, okay, <laughs> is that what we're doing? Okay, if y'all say we, so. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, now we definitely want to get to the same goal, everybody go home. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what that record did. Mm-hmm. It, it, yeah, okay, this high level shit, yeah, 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 but guess what? We all want to go home. We want to make it home. Whether you all white, go home. black, plug, crip, Mexican, whether you hate blacks, hate white, whether you, whatever the fuck you are, the common thing, we all want to get home. Whoever don't want to get home, we got to get rid of that motherfucker quick. It feels like that when you listen to that record. Yeah. There's a certain urgency. I was, it's an urgency to it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and that, that was that. On um, on Kendrick's for free, it seems like you guys are making fun of spoken word <laughs> and the repeated patterns that they use. Now, my friends and I do this purposely, but did you guys intentionally do it, or did it just come out hilarious? You know what? We wasn't being a joke, but we wasn't serious. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's that. So we 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 musically, you very serious. Oh, it was serious. Yeah, but we we I'm. Man, 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 Casamigos, tequila, bomb ass weed. Yes. What you mean? Like, it wasn't, we, you know, motherfuckers wasn't having black flags up in the studio. Right. With all due respect to everybody right. that, that maybe, maybe felt that. We just doing music that our our, house, our hearts felt good and we come from a place of need, which is the ghetto. Mm-hmm. We just trying to feed that. And so, so, I mean, obviously that feeds the world, obviously. Mm-hmm. So thank God for that. But well, on For Free, particularly, that was a, the comical part to me was, this dick ain't free. This dick ain't free. But then when I go past that, <laughs> when I go to the layers, like yeah, it's layers. I'm in so it. happy he did that. I'm so happy you feel that way because mm-hmm. you remember it. And once you stop smiling, tear down the layers. Yeah, it's some shit. Some shit. Oh, it's some shit. And and sometimes we got to spoon feed people with humor, mm-hmm. with love. So it, you know what? It's supposed to be humorous. 
it's supposed to be serious. It's supposed to be everything black is, which is that. So yeah, I uh, I, I don't think on purposely, but I, I think that was that was his impression of, of spoken word. Yeah. Look at this tape. I'm just you know what I'm saying. Because, well, I'm gonna keep it real though, but some of that spoken word should be a joke. <laughs> you know, it's just, funny. Like, look, it's funny. Just because you... motherfuckers be doing this in small yeah. ass yes. with the lights low, don't mean they deep. That's right, right. be shallow as fuck. Uh -huh. That's right. I said that on a Good Morning song for, off the Reflection Eternal album. Well, you quoted I Jessica Care more. Just because they can't understand what you're speaking doesn't mean what yeah. you're saying is deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sometimes when you know, he hey, look. When you first of all, when you hang out with Quali, he not playing deep rap in the car. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's that's the mic. When I hung right. one night, we went to a club, then went to this other spot in New York. It's oh, like, yeah. just like Dilla. You know, when you, when you I tell everybody, you know, when we first got turned into Dilla, as far as my crew, it was through corrupt because corrupt was fucking with them dudes in Detroit. Yeah, he was on that. Slump he was. On, he was. He was corrupt. Two. Is always fucking with everybody. He was. He was on it. If you fuck with that, if you fuck with love and that mic, corrupt is flying to you. Mm. Especially back then, it was like. Yeah, you know, and I think that's that East Coast shit. Like, go to the art and find it and be engulfed in it. So, corrupt was was heavy. Telling us about JD and different things, and then you know it, it got to us through corrupt and Shafiq and those guys like that. But when we started, when JD started moving to LA, we started meeting him. It was so deep because you we thought it was all deep backpack. It was the complete opposite. Oh yeah, of that what's shit. up with that three screw? That's what they said on the album. Yo, yo, that's what the man said. I, and then corrupt be like. <laughs> Bro, when I went to see Dilla, we go to strip clubs. Strip bro. clubs, bro. Yes. That's it. Like big trucks, like, big took, big cars, see, I big took, blunts, see, and yeah. strip clubs. I took Corrupt one night to a Dilla tribute. Mm -hmm. said, what? <laughs> this ain't no what Dilla the tribute. What the fuck is this? <laughs> this ain't no <laughs> like, Jay Dilla. I thought we gonna be partying. Jay Dilla would have hated this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah, you know. That's funny. That's funny. I've done a couple of little Dilla tribute. Shout out to the crew who does the Dilla tribute. Shout out to everybody. They work hard on that, but I understand yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> um, but that that's part of being that yeah. old enough with them in the middle, older mm. to the young enough for the, the like that's I'm always in the middle. So I, I think I was fortunate to catch well, I caught a lot of bad shit too, because I'm in being in the middle in this game, being from LA, LA wasn't popping for a long time mm -hmm. and it was no work. I know that era because it was hard. It was no Y'all got it popping though, man. Y'all the crew that got it popping. It, it, you know it, that. It, it, it worked out. It's yeah. working out. If we, you yeah. know what? We we followed the thing and we we stuck to a script. And we we no matter what, we stuck to the shit where the music is first though. Mm -hmm. Yep. But y'all made it not just for the MCs, the musicians. Oh, Everybody yeah. started being like, something's going on in, in LA. My friend Craig Brockman. Craig Brockman's my big bro. He's a legend. Craig Brockman wrote... So many, why you all in my grill? Keyboard yeah. for all the messy shit, Timberland shit. Craig, Craig's one of my mentors. He's from Pasadena. He's like a god out here on organ and mm -hmm. keys and just the studio. You know, he's 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 a he's the sound to a lot of those early records that everybody loved with mm -hmm. Missy and Timberland. And Craig, being one of my mentors, taught me uh, as a young producer, uh, every instrument you add to a record, you're creating a job. Mm -hmm. I'm a product of uh, a father. And a mother that had to switch reels because the game changed, life changed, drugs came in, broken mm -hmm. hearts. So I'm a product of a kid that lived in motels, lived in these places because the music industry wasn't adding up to what my parents was living. It just wasn't working for a lot of us. And I'm a product of that. So whatever record I produce in my life, it will be a live instrument on it because Craig Brockman told me that's producing a job for somebody. That's beautiful. Mm. So I don't have to play sax on your TV shows. I did the record. I, that's, I turn down those gigs all the time because yeah. I want you to hire somebody else. I did the record. I created a job. It's created a job. When I play keys on that, when I do... Wow, that's if, such if, a if, if, ill if, way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if, if I'm playing basic harmony, then I'm providing the job for the guy that... That has that knows how to laugh at everybody's jokes and play basic harmony. Mm -hmm. But what about the bad motherfucker that may be socially awkward because he practiced so much, but he has a heart of gold and full of art? I need to provide a job for him. Yes. So let me make the harmony dense. Mm. So instead of songs like "We Gonna Be All Right," when I could play, I could play all the smooth jazz shit. Shout out to everybody playing smooth jazz. I love mm -hmm. smooth jazz. When, when I could take that opportunity, and I know it's produced by Pharrell and Soundwave and me and Kendrick Lamar and and Dr. Dre's behind it, Top Dog mm -hmm. and Jimmy. I know what it's gonna fucking do. So why mm -hmm. would I ever take this time to do something that could not provide a job for the guy in the corner? Because wow. the mother motherfuckers is working. Because I remember when my dad didn't work, when my uncle didn't work, 
when my parents didn't work because drum machines came in, Mm -hmm. keyboard horns came in, disco came in. You know, this was a time when when hip hop was an enemy to live musicians. I yeah. grew up at a time in, in hip hop before hip hop and live motherfuckers started working on one accord. Hip hop was an enemy. Yeah, because we, my family, suffered financially because hip hop was ushered in. And that's the perspective we don't hear that. We often, don't hear right? that now. In the same thing that were pushed them back to there. And, yeah. Are the same thing that helps them survive at a high level because of me, because well, of them through me to this day, you know. So that that's how I look at all this shit. Where it's like, you know, wow, wow. that's one of the most nuanced points, and you have to have lived that. There lived is no it. book you can read that mm-hmm. in. There is no academic view of that. That's mm-hmm. something you have to have lived and felt for mm-hmm. you to be someone who grew up loving hip hop, but understanding why. On a very tangible level, mm-hmm. not just on some high-minded academic. That's not real music shit. No, nah. on a very tangible level. Yeah, why there was pushback. A easy, a simple level, bro. Yeah, a simple level. It wasn't yeah. that deep. Wasn't that deep. It, it wasn't that deep. It was just like this. The the, you know, <laughs> those guys. That's what I call enemies. Whoever those people are. I don't. I don't. I can't see a lot of them. You know what I'm saying? But they came pushed out instruments out in the early '70s of every music department. Yeah, but the they, cuts in the schools but in the cities fucked at that up. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know where they fucked up at? The rose that grew from the concrete. They left the records. <laughs> they left the records so we could still hear them. And turntables. Yeah. And see, now here's where I want Oh my God, Quali, they left that. They thought they were getting rid of it, and they left the roadmap to a whole new fucking life that their kids got infected with. Mm-hmm. We just interviewed Open Mike Eagle. And he mentions being at his parents. He mentions uh, the record collection of his father. And, um, excuse me, we had interviewed Pete Rock. Yes. Mm. Shout out and to Pete Rock. Pete Rock was talking about the record collection of his father. So when I was researching for Pete Rock, I was like, wow, my father had the ill record collection too, and that made him the man in his neighborhood. So if you was a black man in the 70s, and you couldn't afford a lot of shit, but you had that record collection. You was the man. And then uh, Iron Open Mike Eagle was talking about the copper coasters because we had the shit out here. Come I was like, on, we man. need, we need coasters. On. He said, we need the old school copper coasters. Come on, and man. And then he was like, and then, you know, we need this velvet paint. And I'm like, I said, Terrace Martin is on his way in here. And velvet portraits is my favorite. That's why I did album. that. You remember the velvet portrait everybody had with the with the lady with the afro? That's how you the... knew somebody was partying. Oh, okay. I do know what those are. Yeah. Okay. I do. So velvet, I portraits. Do. velvet portraits, do. record collections, and that certain folks, they would have their favorite record, the the artwork out. Because back, my, my, my father said, when you had a Miles Davis record. On the corner or something? Out, yeah. Out, Bitches brew? And, and you had a date, they come, oh, you got that Miles? You got <laughs> that Ohio Players? Psh, it's a rap. Nigga, with that fire? They know what's up. <laughs> they know what's up. <laughs> they know what's up. It's a rap. So it's like right, that, right. that that's the era. Like that's the, you know what I'm saying? That's that that's the energy that, that I grew up in heavy, you know. Yeah, and so Velvet Portraits, I felt so I said, Jasmine said right here, I said, when I saw that he named it, I knew who he was talking to and yeah. I know what he was trying to say. It was us. Yeah. yeah. You named a song after your father. This is one of my favorite records you've ever done. Thank, thank Curly you. Martin record. Thank you. Um Tiffany Goucher was also somebody young at my crib. Yeah. With Manny Q back in the day. Yep. Come on you know, now. She was there. She's on this record. Yeah. Uh, Valdez off Crenshaw. So beautiful of a composition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that to me is me hearing the Grover Washington Jr. influence. All, in all the way. Yeah. All the way. Yeah. Gro- um, Grover was, Grover, you know, Grover, first of all, the original song is called Valdez in the Country. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 Donny Hathaway, mm-hmm. uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. If you, but Donny Hathaway made it famous, and the, uh, one of the homies on Crenshaw that live on his name Valdez. And he had black, half Mexican. He just he the homie. You feel mm-hmm. me? I grew up in black and Mexican communities. Mm-hmm. South Central LA is a black and Mexican. It's not El Salvadorian. It's not. You get a couple, but it's black and Mexican. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. it. Like. And I try to explain that shit, but they would they, somebody won't kill me, bro. I, <laughs> you, I, I, I learned I, that when I moved to Miami. <laughs> I did not know there me. was that many different type of uh, Hispanic cultures. Yeah, it's I, different. Now Miami, New York, because my father's Puerto Rican, so Miami, New York, that's different. But the New York was different because we grew up out here with the black and Mexican problem in New York. It's not my that. cousin was like, man, everybody a nigga out here. That's right. 
So the New York shit was different with the with the Latin thing out here. It was like, but that's why I was able my New York shit. I was able to float through LA because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. I was like, I didn't see no problem because we all got pretty girls. Right. I was all about the girls, bro. <laughs> that's it. That's it. If you have you was a pretty girl, I don't care what, what nationality. You were sweet and you like good food and some cool music and you wasn't arguing. I'm fucking with you. If one girl doesn't argue, stop it. I ain't met her yet. (laughs) I've never met a woman that doesn't argue. I'm sorry, women. I'm supposed to be on your side, but it's the truth. Let's edit that because they're going to be killing me. I ain't strong like him. I'm going to be sending hits on motherfuckers. (laughs) Like, hey, I be wanting to slap some people for you. I be like, how did they get that from that? Bro. How did they get that from that? I'd be like, oh. yo, they they literally go from zero to a thousand on Tyler's page. Like, no, you know what? They the people come on my page. It has to be this. They have to have their phone set to alert. It has to, no, no, it has they, to no. Be that. People, people definitely have people notifications. Have, no, people on. have the alerts. Like, yeah. no, don't get they have the notifications because they come bro. immediately. Yeah, yeah. literally. Yeah. And every now and then, through all the twenty, thirty thousand, it's six personal people that I could tell is them. I'll be yeah. on some other shit. You know, I had to stop. I, I, I sometimes I just ignore it because a lot of times the people that they'll keep making new accounts and they're going to Talib's thing and say some shit. Yeah. And Talib's like, "What? Where did you get that from? Yeah. Like, what?" Right. I, but you know what though? Shouts out to everybody that, that honestly. And this is, sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. That I takes to the say. time to go troll. Shouts out to say. And I don't even call it troll. It, the whole point of art is to ignite spark emotion. emotion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the if you're not sparking emotion, you're not doing shit. Right. Whether, whether, and I, some people say, you know, I know somebody will say if we keep this, but on one account, on a one, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But the fact is, like in the internet world, everybody's guilty to proving innocent. It's the mm-hmm. craziest That's shit right. ever, right? I'm talking about. I've seen my friends be accused of murder because of the internet. Yep. You know, so the internet is a deadly place to play, and it's impossible to fight. Mm-hmm. Only thing to do with the internet, you got to hold your peace, speak your mind. And move on. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's a dangerous place to play though if you really get into it because you can't you can't find everybody. <laughs> I was I just had this conversation, and also what you're saying is that you do still have to you know if they are taking their time to come make a comment, it's like you're worried about me. The Rick James comments. Yeah, it's well, all the, good. The, the, the other flip is let time me, to come are, and write it. Are we addressing these Rick James the, comments? I now? called her Ricky, and it's fun. yeah. Yeah, let me say this though. What's important, and I and this is something we should keep <laughs> right here. We should keep this right here. This is conscious, and I tell artists all the time. The biggest thing for us or anybody with the internet is that your enemies could see you. Mm-hmm. They know what you look like. Mm-hmm. You can't see. You don't people. know what they look like. Yeah. So it, it's a certain you're at an way. Automatic disadvantage. You 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 lost. So to to even combat in a, at a hateful way without just being clear mm-hmm. is the is the internet the wrong way? Because I I don't underestimate nobody. You know, a lot of few of my friends that underestimate somebody got popped. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't I don't underestimate nobody. I keep my shit cordial and cool. I don't disrespect nobody. I keep it smooth. People be trolling all the time, but it don't even now it don't, it don't bother me. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I can't even. It. I can't really fuck with it, but I say my piece and I, I hold it down. You know, I try not to say shit, but then, you know, mm-hmm. you if somebody comes at you, say another public figure. I, I, you know, we're aware, of, mm-hmm. we, we, we won't give nobody shine, but mm-hmm. comes after the, the you and it's mm-hmm. like, if you, damn if you don't say nothing, yeah. damn if you don't. But it is wise to respectfully document your piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe, I, I believe that. I believe in this today world, you may do more damage or being silent. Ignoring. Yeah, I mm-hmm. agree with that. You know. And people say, you got to ignore it, but no, 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 no. Because the internet is reality now. Mm-hmm. You, you better respect I mean, it. look, we on Uber. We on. We can't order food unless it's through DoorDash. I saw a DoorDash motherfucker the other day, bro. DoorDash. <laughs> and, I, and I took a, li- a, pl- a picture of his license. I was, I'm, I'm that guy now. Right, right. And he picked You're up some food from the vegan spot for somebody. Mm-hmm. Had his mat and was blowing his nose, coughing, and looked in the bag and... So I, I, you know, I, 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 I took a picture of his license plate, but I was like, damn, I, you know, I, I so got the don't snitch thing in my body. I just, <laughs> this is a yeah, thing Yeah, I mean, though. you don't want to put nobody in a system. We, we want to protect our system. That's all. But I'm like, damn, bro. 
Yeah. Damn, bro. Yeah. Got anyway, it. we went off a whole tangent. Somebody I, said I, that your hair looked like the Rick James. From oh, what? Princess Bride. That's hard. You know what? <laughs> At the end hard. of the day, it's all good. But what I was about to say about you gonna be food, mad when I tell you who said it too. I'm gonna tell you. Off oh, I know the person. Oh, fuck them. <laughs> um, but was it Dave? If not, then fuck them. No, it wasn't Dave. Um, <laughs> with food, I've worked in restaurant. Well, I used to. I'm in entertainment now. But for 15 mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. And there's been so many gross things that happen. Yeah. Servers don't wash their hands. You've eaten all types of shit. So just don't worry about it because you're eating crap anyway. Well, one time I was in Friday's mm-hmm. in the Ladera Center. Mm-hmm. Friday's. In the Ladera Center. In the Ladera Center. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I, and I was having dinner with, with, I was having dinner with the homegirl. She could vouch for this. And, and I was cutting a piece of salmon. And I saw some blue. What? A and deal. I picked it up, and it was a fucking tongue ring. <laughs> That's why you can't wear tongue rings at in a restaurant. I never ate Fridays again in my life. I just wanted to say. And that. I love Fridays, and I used to work in at Fridays. Center. Damn, it was like a tongue ring with some Jack Daniels whiskey barbecue. Yeah, we had <laughs> salmon. I was like, yo, dinner party. You y'all got us through the pandemic. Helped to get us through the pandemic with this. Kamasi Washington, Robert Glasper, Knife Wonder, and by the way, one of my favorite songs I've ever done is that uh, Wonder Years joint with the Never Stop Loving You. Come so on thank now, you for yeah, that. yeah. Um, Felix, is that the right way yep, to say? Felix, yeah. Um, great video for Freeze Tag. It made us feel yeah. like warm and fuzzy. Wow. Sleepless Nights is such a beautiful piece of music. Um, well, then we we from the era of that drum break. Oh, okay, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, LL. It, 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 yeah, it, that it, it feels like home. It does. It's it very feels like familiar. Home, yeah. Um, will y'all do that again? The dinner party. Man, we did that. Me and Robert came with that idea backstage of, of a show in in London. We had mm-hmm. a we had a group called R Plus R as well, mm-hmm. and we was met, we was on tour when we dinner party idea came off that same tour. We saw you okay, at yeah, Quincy's yeah. party in Switzerland. That sounds so Hollywood, but no, it really. <laughs> the, we were hanging out with Q, yeah, you know. Twitch, you like, and pick Q up these names and R right, and Y, and, right? Yeah, and K and. <laughs> but you know, Robert's always trying to figure out a new shit. Me too. So I'm, we, me and him, was like, "Yo, let's DJ parties." And I, me and him, was like, then we, like, nah, that's that's corny because we don't we don't do that. We don't, mm. you know. I don't even want to learn Serato. You know, mm. I'll call you. Right, I'll come you know, DJ I, your party. Yeah, you come to yeah. the party. <laughs> that's that's a, then we'll talk about that. Okay, that's, that's a thing. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah. Um, but Rob, me and Rob was like, yo, how do we respectfully eliminate the band mm-hmm. <laughs> so we could tour with just three people, mm-hmm. get this bag, and just right. hit the hit hit jazz spots, but also just hit clubs like keyboard, horn, the keyboard, a DJ, and just rock a club instead of because I I've always felt like when it's good we play instruments and children are inspired by instruments, but sometimes instruments can look intimidating. To people because because of the system wiped them out for so long. Yeah, they're and not, they're it's not systemic, norm. and a lot of people, like you said, the horn costs more than the gig sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. for a lot of people in inner cities, when they wiped out those instruments, yeah. people don't have access to them. That's how hip hop was born. Yeah. And and I hate most hip hop bands. Yeah, I think bands play hip hop hard, but they play like RB music. Like I like the I, roots are the exception to the rule. The roots for are a the reason. ones for the reason. The roots are the ones. Yeah, the, yeah you know. But bands. everybody, I feel like when it comes to hip hop. Like, I'm a real hip hop head before I'm anything. So, I want to hear that snare. I want to hear that. You want to hear that imperfectness. I want to hear that shit that and I bought. Maybe the, the out of phase, out of tune. I want to hear that. I, yeah. I don't want to hear all these substitution chords and an interpolation. Aren't. I don't a wanna, version of a hip hop song. Nah, not now when I'm going right. to hear motherfucking Man, some shit. I heard the elevator Muzak version of Get By one day, and it fucked me up. <laughs> Because it fucked me up. It was it was it was conflicting because it's yeah. like that's not it. But at the that, same yeah. time, it's it's cool. Well, I'm at the point where someone felt that they could do that, mm-hmm. so it's good. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, I have some lasting value. Yeah. But at the same time, would you stop? Yeah. <laughs> the only hip hop bands I've ever loved was was that played hip hop, and this is my personal opinion. Mm-hmm. The Roots and the Snoopadelics with Snoop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I well, you, like, like you said, Snoop know his music. Yeah, and he was firm on like he didn't he didn't know what times were called with drums. He'd be like, "Hey, the drummer keep playing these like things that ain't in the what, yeah. what's these?" And we'd be like, "Get rid of the times." Yeah, because it's just snare, kick, or clap on a yeah. record. So playing with Snoop taught me how to really play in that style of music to where that's helped me feed my children. Yeah, you know. So when people be like, "You do this, you do that," I'd be like, "Yeah, I really went to the school of that shit." And the Roots was the only ones. That I was listening to that was really like I'm Quest Love. 
tuning his snares and match even to this day mm-hmm. when he plays on record. So you know the the uh, you know the the band thing. Our reach will be longer if we could play smaller spots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. that's deep. Most folks are if we could play bigger spots, but I'm like, yo, we can't fuck with the ghetto with ten niggas with us, bro. The status ain't big, and they ain't got it. Just we it can't move like that. We gotta be in and out to make an impact. And people in the hood, they want to hear the record how it is with the live energy on top. They don't want to hear the record on top of the live energy. Yeah, they, they wanted the live. The energy is the record. So, Robert was like, "Yo, we it's do like we- the Diddy, the Bad Boy documentary that he put out after he went on a tour." And he's going over the songs with the band. Exactly. And he's like, this ain't the jazz fest, nigga. This the bad boy tour. Mm. And that and that's the kind that was yeah. Snoop too. Yeah. So dinner party, I was like, yo, we we both was like, yo, let's let's not even gamble and go and get a DJ. So the yeah. first idea started with us getting different songs by different people, different producers and different things, and and maybe taking the DJ on the road to spin them. But then I told Knife Wonder what's up. Knife Wonder sent me a, a seven beats. Those are the records. Those are the records. He texted them to me. I didn't get the I didn't I, I didn't have to, I didn't I wasn't like send me the files and I need to get the files. I was yeah, like, oh we in. got them. Hey bro, I'ma airdrop this to you, bro. Boop. <laughs> and we did that record at East West Studio, me working on somebody else's session. You know how we do. And that's right. Get you know, in. when the artists leave, call get up the in. homies. My whole career started because of that. Yeah. Man. Yeah, we all did. So that that was that was dinner party. Knife Wonder happened to be the band that was like ready. Well, yeah. I, we told a few people about it, but Knife, as he does, the follow through. Oh. He's one of the yeah. top three black men in this record business that his follow through is in impe- His career is built on that. honesty is so, mm-hmm. even things I don't agree with, his honesty is so for real. You have I to concur. love and respect it. Oh yeah, you know, knife, 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 crazy. I already know. Knife says some shit, but you know what? Knife, knife, knife is our brother. He cares about it more than most people, oh, and that's what it is. He cares. Oh yeah, he cares. He cares. And that's important. That, yeah. That's why he's one of my. I follow his lead. You know, I follow his lead. You know, I do. He's he's somebody who. My relationship with Knife is interesting in that way because he's somebody who came out after me, hugely influenced by what we did, but is still older than me. Yeah, it's deep. So when we talks to me, it's like the OG, but I don't want to be hearing that OG yeah. shit from him because you came out after me. Yeah, so yeah. it's a whole thing. It's deep, <laughs> he, he, and you know what he? Uh, uh, even me, I started so young in this game. Yeah, you know, I started before him in this game. Mm-hmm. But but he fell in love with hip hop before I met her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and her saying for where I for me, I'm saying her. But uh, in 2020, real quick, you also did Conscious Conversations and uh, Soul Juice. How has the year been like for you? Because it seems like you've kept yourself very busy during the quarantine. Man, I've been very busy since 14. Amen to that. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I tell you, you know, the quarantine, the pan- black folks been living in pan- pandemics and quarantines. That's right. Welcome it, to it, our life. It, it, welcome. You know, yeah. we can't go out. Well, motherfucker, we can't. We ain't been being able to go out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's scared of going out getting sick. We scared of going out getting shot. Mm. So it's like the pandemic, it wasn't, you know, we, respectfully, we we lost some people. And it was deep that the virus is out there. But every day is deep being black. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a virus called killing it going on right mm-hmm. now. So, you know, my, my ain't thing... Ain't got no cure either. Ain't no vaccination. Nah, ain't, ain't no vaccine. So my thing with even giving COVID and different things that much placement in my life is is a, is a strange thing. I've been safe. My family's been safe, and we've been affected by it. it. Was the changes of life, but we ain't we ain't bowed down, we ain't kneeled down, mm-hmm. we ain't we ain't submit to nothing that this country ever thrown at us. And as a people, as a man, me personally, Terrence Martin, and my family, my kids, being a black man, we we don't submit to nothing this country has to do, whether it's good or bad. We walk our walk, and we walk our life. So when the pandemic came, I kept pressing play on the same plan I had before the pandemic was right. to go. Just like just like you know. I dropped a song called Pig Feet. Everybody was like, it's so timely. It's timely. Oh. We did that song. We do. We, I got a library of that song because it's been it's going on. The verses on that song are amazing too. I, of course, you would like them. Oh, I like yeah, them. First of all, I was I was picky. You know, I was like, yeah. Because <laughs> because when you're dealing with an MC Posse song, you know, yeah. it's like because I'm sitting there because everybody. Those are conscious MCs on that record, but not MCs that you would think of for that record. I put G Perico talking to break Yo, the shit up. I met him when I did. <laughs> uh, Black Jesus 
I you, did a scene with Slink in them, Slink, which is bro, it was so the West most, Coast, bro. This is the most crip shit I ever did bro, in my you, life. But you so West Coast, <laughs> everybody fuck with you in LA, yeah. bro. Look at Black Jesus, the scene of when Black Jesus takes a day off of being Black Jesus, and so he could just chill, and he has a party. And as you know, Alan Maldonado yeah. was playing uh, Young Lil. Yeah, he had Young Lil House having a party. And G Perico's there. And, and he's like, is that Kwali there? And I'm in the party like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, uh, since he was so busy during the pandemic, let's applaud Terrence for being a guy who learned about vegetarians when he got to Santa Monica High. Yeah. And then fast forward, he does an album called Soul Juice where he names songs after ginger and turmeric. Oh, oh, let's yeah. give it up for... Leveling Look up your health high level through juices. music. Come on, now we got to do it. He gave us a whole health lesson when he got here. He did. I'm like, oh, that's that soul juice. I never heard it's about so, broccoli, yeah. though. I never knew you can eat broccoli. I eat broccoli all the time. I mean, I mean it's a hybrid vegetable. It's not even supposed to be here. Broccolini is, too, and it's even better than broccoli. <laughs> I know. Now, my favorite Shouts out to broccoli. I grew up eating cheese and broccoli. Yeah, man. Me, too. My favorite beat from last year, um, Master Fard Muhammad. Oh, yeah. You worked on that with High Tech. Yeah, yeah, off yeah. Off the Busta Rhymes album. Bust. <laughs> Busta motherfucking Come Rhymes. On. The God. Do you plan on working more with Busta Rhymes and with High Tech? Yeah. First of all, High Tech just sent me a pack. Really? Yeah. Can I hear it? <laughs> 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 well, he sent me one last year. I finally gave him one. He sent me a pack. I got a pack from High Tech about two years ago. I recorded to all the beats. We're going to do another Reflection Eternal album. And they're probably Timeless Records with you and him. They are Timeless. Yeah. Th that's the vibe. Because y'all y'all, y'all say Timeless thing. Yeah. He used Timeless Instruments. But uh, yeah, we uh, High Tech sent me that for, for, for my record in maybe 2010, 2009 Ooh. or something like that. Mm. And I did some shit on it and just, you know, messed around with it. And then I sent it to Busta Rhymes. Bust bust. Back then, though. There's a version of me rhyming on that beat. Wow. When High Tech had it. That's on from? the internet. I don't know the name of it. I got to call my man Beef Sausage. Because Beef Sausage, when he heard the Busta Beef Rhymes. Beef Sausage? That's his name. He actually, that was what we called it back in the day. He changed it to <laughs> Be Efficient. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank it went you. From Beef Sausage Shouts to Be Efficient. That's out to Be Efficient. <laughs> but when the Busta album came out, he's like, yo, they used that joint that you and High Tech did back in the yeah. day. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the one with the, with the one with Rick Ross on it. Yeah. One, I was like, okay, that loop sounds familiar, but I don't remember rapping on it. He said, hold on, son. And he and sent he had... me a YouTube link wow. of me rapping on that beat <sighs> over when High Tech first So you had, had it before, before I had it. Yeah. See, so when I had it, it was just the loop. Yeah. Then I said, oh, that's right, keys and horn. And... Matter of fact, uh, 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 Kenneth Crouch, keyboard player, songwriter, mm -hmm. he played roles on that. And I added, I remember 808 horn, and I remember me loving the loop, mm -hmm. but me saying, dang, man, we gotta make sure the cut list hit this. And it's high tech, let me put that 808 in it. Yeah. But Bust loved that record. He had that record, he was sitting on that record for a long. Yo, Terrence, don't, don't give away that record. Yeah. And I'd be like, Bust. I was at those, I've, one of my pastimes is visiting Busta Rhymes at the studio, 42nd Street, whenever I'm in New York. And you know, if you're in New York, if you know, if you know where to go, you will, you can go, you can walk right to where Buster Rhymes is Easily. at. He's there every night. Easily. Working. Yeah, working every night for the last 10 years. So this record, everybody, I've heard these records. That yeah. Kendrick, Michael Jackson yeah. record, I heard that record. He's still working in the studio right now. Yeah. Only, he's a studio, bro, I learned so much from Buster Rhymes, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I, I, I didn't, he's, oh man, he needs a, my, he's so hip hop. He, he, he gets credit for being a lot, but Buster Rhymes to me is a god. Not only a god MC, but he's not a only the god because he's five percent, but all of that, all of that. Yeah. And first of all, like nobody, nobody. Like I, I, I look at Buster. It's a few cats that play a rhythm like instruments to me. You play, you always play a rhythm. That that your thing is always like water. Mm -hmm. Buster Rhymes thing is always like it's so syncopated in between. Mm -hmm. It's like you you float over, he floats in. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's it, mm -hmm. like that's why me and Kendrick was so tied to y'all a lot because of the them rhythms, man. Yeah, They're different things, no doubt. Um, is it true that Jay Leno helped you with a scholarship and help get your first home? For sure. Yeah, Tell that Jay, story real quick. Bro, I was I was in high school, ditching school, catching up the bus to go to Jay Leno because Reggie Andrews, my teacher at Locke, he taught me Kamasi Washington, Thundercat, Ronald Bruner, Tyrese, Gerald Albright. I mean. Lock High was is like our mm -hmm. fame, right? And you named Project after that, because yeah, of for this. sure, for yeah. sure. It's 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 that legendary mm -hmm. in LA. If you went to Lock, you know, you the shit. 
Mm-hmm. I'm the shit because I want the lock yeah. for sure. Yeah. Because if you could survive not getting chipped, mm-hmm. not no not no rap video shit. If you could survive not getting chipped at lock at the time I went and just do your music and still go to school, psh, mm. you know, you know they, 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 they say you can make it in New York, you make it anywhere. Make it lock, lock high. Tuh. Because you had to be cool with all different hoods, you know, all my Mexican brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. nobody white. Mm-hmm. Maybe... No, I don't think I see no. Maybe not maybe, even Michelle Pfeiffer. Maybe a sub teacher that came <laughs> in. You know what I'm saying? Dangerous minds ass. I didn't have any white. We gonna teach the black kids named Jamal. That's your middle name too. That's my yeah. brother's name. Word. Jamal. There's always a black kid named Jamal. Who All gets the time. Taught so I, the- <laughs> I was going to lock man. Then I was, but I was because Reggie Andrews was teaching us about the music business, and at the time I was really digging the saxophone heavy and keyboard too, and he was you know teaching me. Uh, uh, I had I had already been reading music and sight reading and really practicing on reading every day. I said, man, you really want to, you know, you want to be able to feed your family, so you got to go be around the cats that play instruments for a living. So mm-hmm. I would catch the bus up to the Jay Leno show and hang out with, with one of my mentors back then, a guy named Ralph Moore mm-hmm. that had just moved in town from New York. This was the show uh, after Branford left, Kevin Eubanks took over. Yeah, so it was still a New York crew yeah. in L.A., the New York musicians, uh, Marvin Smitty Smith, Ralph Moore, all the New York cats, you know, mm-hmm. Kenny Kirkland was there at one point. All it was like New York and LA. And I knew that all my favorite jazz musicians were on the Tonight Show. So me being just knowing how to get in wherever, mm-hmm. I used that for positive and kept sneaking into the Jay Leno show, studying Ralph Moore, him reading charts. And one day I just went up to him and I built a friendship. And then he's like, yo, you know, Jay's having a scholarship for all the all the decent players from here in New York. For college, you should audition, and I auditioned, and back then I was, I, it was mm-hmm. like my energy that went into, I want to be a crip, I want to be a loke, I want to fuck with the homies. It went all into Sonny Stitt and Charlie mm-hmm. Parker. That same energy behind, like being, you know, loving guns and like, like being like look, collecting, knowing and just loving guns. I still love guns all my life. Mm-hmm. Still have a gun collection, legit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, Good shooter too. Okay. Great shooter. Okay. You know, one hand. Okay. You know that's that's hood shit. But you know, but uh, <laughs> cock to the side. Uh, it was it was it was no. <laughs> you know, hit yourself. Right. Uh, um, but but all that energy went into loving guns, loving negative, loving feuding, loving uh, seeing motherfuckers get fucked up. Loving drama, loving evil, loving gossiping, loving talking bad about my friends. All these things that start developing in me young, for some that just the creator made it all go into the saxophone. You know what I'm saying? So when I when when that horn came, man, all the focus just went. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. And then the horn became just like this thing. So Jay Leno, so I was so sprung on knowing about the horn. Mm-hmm. I would catch the bus any. I would ditch school and catch the bus up to UCLA. When I when people say, "Yo, you heard of Joshua Redman?" Mm. Nah, go buy a CD. I'll go to Tower Records, Third Street Promenade, Tower Records. Joshua Redman, the album Wish, Billy Higgins. Oh, Billy, Billy Higgins. Billy Higgins. Yeah. He lives in the neighborhood. Oh, Wish, Charlie Hayden, Pat Metheny. My aunties them used to sing with Pat Metheny. The Perry mm. I know Pat. Sign on Tower Records. He's UCLA Friday, four p.m. And Terrence Blanchard. Wow. 4 p.m., damn. Wow. But meet and greet at 1. I got to ditch school, get to the meet and greet. The 3 was the Lincoln bus. <clears throat> and if you stayed on the 3, the last stop of that 3 was UCLA. Most buses on the west side, the last stop is mm-hmm. UCLA. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know nothing about UCLA, but I knew this bus was the, it would say last stop UCLA. Right. Joshua Redman, it wasn't no smartphones. It was <laughs> right. You just had to figure it out. Fuck it. I think that say UCLA. I'ma go. I'm from South Central. I'm in Santa Monica. Nothing's scary to me over here. Mm-hmm. So right. if I'ma I get go. lost, it's okay. Yeah. I went to UCLA. I asked around where I'm looking for the music room. Schoenberg. That's what they said. It was called Schoenberg. And Named after Arthur Schoenberg. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know who the fuck he yeah. was. You know what I'm saying? Schoenberg. Go to Schoenberg. Where the fuck? Anyway, I walk in there. I remember walking into the classroom hearing Joshua Redman play. I never heard saxophone sound like this. I was in ninth grade. And I remember hearing him. He was playing a song called Yesterdays. The twins, 
two white cats that I loved back then, Mark Ferber and Alan Ferber. I haven't seen these guys and even said their names in 20-something years, mm. since the 90s. Mark Ferber played drums. Alan Ferber played trombone. They were very great guys, sweet, mm. knowledgeable guys. And they was playing yesterday. Josh, he was playing some of the most amazing shit. I don't know what it was then. Mm. But I remember seeing him play and saying, now, for sure, I got to be that. Yeah. Fuck everything else. I got to be that. And then after that, bro, seeing Josh Redman live, ditching school, seeing that, it just kept going. It just kept fucking going. And that I just kept getting sprung to that where I left hip hop alone for two years. Wow. I could, my brain couldn't even hear it. Yeah, I feel like for jazz, that's that type of focus is required yeah, to be was. good at jazz. Glasper said on our show, he said to be, he said to... Like a a bad is, jazz player is better than the best players of everything else. Mm. Me and Robert are very tight. That's my brother. Yeah, you know. <laughs> that's some jazz leadership. That, that's some jazz. Okay. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's some jazz. <laughs> shout but, out to Glad. Shout out to Glad. No, no, but I, but I, I, I know understand what you mean. the intention. No, I know what he means because yeah. I, because we, we both know a lot of jazz motherfuckers that can't do a damn session at all because they want to play everything that they, they, they feel like the world should know. Like, oh, I'm going to teach you. Like, I'm going to show I'm you what I know. You. I go to that, bro. When I walk yeah. in the clubs, I see other horn players. They get to looking at me hard, especially in New York. New York mm -hmm. is so... I love it in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, the horn players they, they, The horn players in New York always beat me up. <laughs> you making me think of Maurice Mo Better Brown. First of all... Who will show up at your gig he never and sleeps. be like, I'm playing tonight. Fuck oh, that. with the <laughs> horn right here. Yeah, the trumpet. That's and my he man. He love you. Oh, that's uh, my he man. He love you. We have a records together. That's my man. That's, hey, he don't sleep. He don't. He go to every gig. He don't sleep. He go to every gig Maurice, and jump on. Now Maurice is one of the ones that could play and do every session. Yeah, yeah, though. yeah. A lot of cats. I'm talking. He about, make beats too. Yeah, it would make it the beats. Maurice gonna do whatever it takes. That's right. He a real hustler. That's right. Chicago and, and hustler. Shouts out to Maurice, the Chicago hustler, New Orleans hustler, and New York. Yep. He, he, he went to. He, he might went show to, up right now with his horn right, right there, now, bro. He, we conjured this nigga up. with glasses on. <laughs> yo, 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 and he 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 always gonna ask, yo, yo what you doing after this? We're, nigga right, going to bed. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Go by the studio. Go to by the studio. That's but, right. but but Maurice is a pillar in this community. But he's you know Maurice. he's definitely part of that New York hustler scene. Oh, he's still so And I've seen him go to clubs and watch the other horn players. Like, first of all, he could play. He's one of the best trump players yeah. in the world. You know, but you know, back in New York, when you go to New York, especially with the jazz thing, it's so competitive. You mm -hmm. know, always been, and I love that. You know, now when I go to New York, I see all my heroes and the cats I love playing. Mm -hmm. You know, even the cats that don't like me, I buy, I buy the whole bar of drinks. That's right, because I can. That's and right. I want them to feel good about their life. And then I want them to tell them, don't worry about competing with me. That's right. Take care of your fucking family. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what I'm competing with, taking care I'm of my, my family. own competition. That's it. That's right. You know? I, I, I buy my competition drinks. I'm sure you went through <laughs> that because you're literally one of the best noted. Like, even if you don't want to say it, like, mm. like 50 Cent diss everybody. Right. Oh, sorry. He loves you. Right. Jay Z. He, it's funny because you said you bought. Uh, to buy everybody a drink. Last time I seen 50 Cent was last month at a strip club in Atlanta, Magic yeah. City, for Akinelli's birthday party. And the first thing he did was hand me a bottle of champagne. It's fit. And of course, it's his champagne that he's Come promoting. Come on now. But it still count. Hey, it's fit. <laughs> you know, shouts out to V. That's no one of my early master teachers, too. He was, 50 Cent was the only rapper I ever known in my life play, pay full price for mixtape beats. Yep. Mm. yep. You know, he was giving me twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for mix, him and Sean Money and them. Yep. I was going to New York every other weekend, rather at Sony, working at Sony mm -hmm. for mixtape beats. Shout out to Sean Money. They had a vision. They knew what they was doing. Yeah. Um, and D Prosper, Sean oh, D Money, Prosper. D Prosper, and Fifth. That that was the unit that was really because we went on tour with right. them. You played a solo on a horn. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Shout yep. out to D Prosper. Definitely. Yeah. D Prosper. D Prosper been in my life since I met him through Fifth. Real quick, D Prosper. When I met D Prosper, he was a spoken word artist, and he was touring with Fife Dog's mom, Cheryl Boyce Taylor, doing like a a a, a poetry slam <sighs> tour, and then he did a record with Bobito. Where he, he like he where he's a rapper on the record. Wow. But then he did the beat for Mr. Nigga on Most Def's album. D Prosper, bro? This is the same D Prosper. Then D Prosper was, I don't want to tell too much of his business, but he was in a game heavy, and the game sometimes gets rough on people. And he was he had a rough couple of years, but then he came back. He had a bad setback. Yeah. Like in the streets, set bad setback. Yeah. And then he was in New York, built his name up as a club party promoter yeah. with 
like started to build his name up in the clubs to the point where, and he knew all the producers to the point where 50 Cent blew up. Well, I'm, I need you to A&R. Yeah. And then he parlayed that into whatever he's doing yeah. now. Like I've watched that man he, from, yeah. man. I bro, D, 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 D Props have been heavy in my career for over a decade. Yeah. My friend, person coming to my house. Yeah. I remember getting, losing homes, getting evicted. He always came for some reason. The last week I was had to move out. He'd come hang out. And he always, he always bring me records and always bring me good vibes. Ask me if I'm hip to some. Deep Prosper's been a blessing in my life since. Yeah, he's a connector. He's a connector. And I met Deep Prosper and Shaw Money and Fifth all through Jilly Iyer, my own girl mm -hmm. Jilly Iyer. That's always connecting dots in LA too with Snoop and everybody. She's another Los Angeles real power oh, Jilly. player. Jilly Iyer, people don't people don't talk well, about I that. I heard name. that name and I didn't know her last name, but I know Jilly Jilly. Definitely. Yeah, Jilly Iyer is connected to all, she was early with with me in my career. Mm -hmm. She always connected the dots. Yeah, shout out to Jilly. Yeah, my my, my early trips are going to New York, really cracking through New York. Because mm -hmm. uh, my thing when LA was down, that's why I'd be calling you all the time. I'd be in New York so much because when LA was down in them years, because the songs I did with you are few, I was able to kind of walk through New York mm -hmm. and kind of make a little money. And so the New York thing was really helpful to me. So and Jilly was living in New York. So that's Jilly, right. Jilly would took me to. To me, Hove, to me, uh, I mean, OG Wan. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. true life. Jilly was a big bridge to my New York thing that I, I still use to this day. Shout out to Jilly. And, um, man, thank you for coming on this show. It's all and good. We got to do this record. I, I, we could talk all day, but we I want to hear these beats. Yeah, I got the and beats. And they can't hear the beats yet. So we're going to have to end beats. this conversation. I, I, can I leave with something for the internet, though? Yes. For the internet. You know, people, people, pe people look at it as it's a simple gesture to... Say something good or bad with your thumbs on mm -hmm. the internet, you know. But if, if you're out there and you have a son, a daughter, a loved one, or even if you're going through doubt and different things like that, you know, we, we all got to be more kind to each other and be more cautious to each other because we don't see the reports of how many children are committing suicide these mm -hmm. days or how many grown people are committing suicide because of slander on the internet, and everybody thinks it's cute until it knocks on your door with mm -hmm. your mother, your daughter, your father, your son. You know, I look at how they just treat anybody when they get any bit of news. Like, you're, this is somebody's father, somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's auntie, and everybody says that, but it is no fun when the rapper got the gun. You know, we, gr growing up in South Central, y'all yeah, remember the first time I felt that stomach feeling somebody that I love got killed. And mm -hmm. before somebody got killed, we used to not joke about it at all, but it was light talk because everybody mm -hmm. was getting killed until it came to you. Mm -hmm. You know, so people on the internet, I'm, I'm saying this on this show particularly, whether you keep it or not, because he, I, I'm a fan of you and you're my personal brother. So mm -hmm. I, I know certain things what, what, just by reading and other things been going on, but I, I, I leave everybody with this. Be conscious because at the end of the day, you have to answer for the things you've done in your soul and, and, and by shifting things and saying evil things without proof to anybody, mm -hmm. those now things that, that if it's any right or wrong, those things are now on your belt because you now you just involve yourself in a, in a karma type thing that didn't involve you. And if it's wrong, those things are now on your belt. And those that don't believe in it, you don't got to believe in it. But it comes to mm -hmm. you. And just be prepared when it comes to you. That's what I leave with, with uh, trolling and everything. You know, be prepared. You know, like I, I, I actually, you know, the kid's 6'9". I was following him. You know what I'm saying? And I thought it was entertaining a lot of shit because mm -hmm. I get dark sometimes. And I think mm -hmm. dark shit is entertaining, right. unfortunately, you know. But uh, 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 I send love to him. Yeah, I send love to his family. I send love to the cats he was involved with. It, it was just a whole situation that just could have went to the left and it went to the right, you know. And it was based off just a huge misunderstanding with everybody. But when when your mother's dealing with sicknesses, and your father, and you're dealing with you're dealing with doubt, and and you've been accused of something that could ruin your fucking life, and it's no proof. Mm -hmm. You don't know what that's like exactly you yeah. don't know what it's like to go through addiction when you say a uh, a, a, a drug head or he's fucked up or you don't know mm -hmm. and, and to the older rappers that now they say you know the, the, you know it's in style to be a user if you mm -hmm. ain't never been through addiction yeah. shut the fuck up because yeah, you don't you know right. what these people are nobody knows nobody's going through my thing is i just pray that we all be more conscious of each other's feelings we ain't got to be kumbaya but just be conscious. That's that's all I'm saying, you know. Well, I'm glad you said that. Um, to respond very quickly, um, the six nine thing. 
you're talking about a level of forgiveness and understanding that a lot of people are not ready to deal with. A lot of people uh, use what's going on the internet to project uh, feelings of toughness. It mm. makes people feel good to be like, I'd never snitch. I don't have no snitches in my mm. circle. You probably do have some snitches yeah. in your circle. Well, and then they're just just from the street standpoint, you know, snitching goes through different mm-hmm. stages. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're not involved in that world, that's right. Then it don't apply to you. But if you a person, if you a crew that's involved mm-hmm. in that world mm-hmm. and you doing high level street shit with somebody that's not of that world, mm-hmm. it's it's a lot. It's a lot of layers to these, yeah. these conversations. You know what I'm saying? And just in terms of what you said, this is something that, of course, I've dealt with. The idea, I push back against the idea that celebrity, with all this privilege, are being famous with all this privilege, because I don't like to look at myself as a celebrity. I'm an artist, Mm -hmm. but I have developed some fame. It can't get to the point where we can ignore our humanity because we get famous. And just because people, you know, the idea that people who are famous should just accept and take whatever said about them, yeah. Some of this you ask for, and some of this you got to accept. Yeah, you have. We we got we get a lot of privileges from having fame, yeah. so it comes with a little bullshit. It comes we with have, it. We have to accept it sometimes. It comes with it. But for me, what's hard for me to deal with, and at every re- every time you see me get in trouble, it's for the same reason. Is because when somebody crosses the line and starts talking about family and kids yeah. and wives and personal shit, that's where I feel protective as a man. I grew yeah. up to yeah. protect that. So you could talk. Yeah. People talk about my music. People say my style's too wordy. I'm corny. They are, they like most deathbed. All types of shit. Yeah. You never see me responding to no shit like yeah. that. When you start talking about a social justice issue, or you start talking about family. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard for me to. to well, you know they, they they don't they don't like any black man that speaks up though. Yeah. You know any any black man that speaks up is argumentative, is aggressive. Yeah. You know I I, I had a long term friend. You know for about five six years I, I he grew, grew his friends and and he's a white cat you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, this George Floyd thing kicked off, and you know it was the conversation. I guess for him it was awkward, but I'm, I was just talking, venting yeah. about certain things, and yeah. he was like, "Man, why are you so upset? That ruined my. Mad, bro, I don't even want to talk to that motherfucker to this day. Mm-hmm. I feel you, because motherfucker, I'm not upset, and even because I say motherfucker, I'm not upset. Right, and we've learned how to I'm, say I'm just being I'm, firm. We learn how to be firm, yeah, even with a smile on the face, because even if we be appear firm. upset, yeah. that gives yeah. them a reason. So your your thing is they don't like you because you just talking. You just mm-hmm. talking your piece. Mm-hmm. They didn't like anybody to talk their piece, and they not gonna like anybody to talk their piece. You know that's what that's just what society does. If you speak up as a black man, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. You can't name me one situation where they don't try to pit us as being wrong in no situation, speaking of whether it's artistically, socially, or anything like that. I literally just unfortunately had to remove myself yeah. from a friend because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to become angry. Yeah. By you putting that on me. Because yeah. you ain't seen angry. You ain't seen angry. You ain't seen it. Cause you don't want you, don't, you don't even want to see it. It happened so fast with me. The time it's with you, it's, it's a rap, bro. It's not, <laughs> we not, I'm not playing. I'm de- I'm dealing with God and the art. To slow down that. And I think as black men, because we we grow up knowing our history. That's a hard thing to know. You was fucking with us and we got to work. That's a hard thing to know. Mm-hmm. You know, and those things could come off a certain way. So, yeah, I, I just ended a relationship for that shit. My homeboy, man, he was a good, he was a good dude. Well, maybe he'll watch this and he'll learn and he'll be a better person and a better friend to you. You know what? Hopefully, you know, I, I hope you're watching this. And you <laughs> know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You know? Because next time you say that, I might slap the dog shit out you. <laughs> and then that'll be angry. Right. With love. With, With love. a smile on his face. With I love, love it. The People's Party has Terrace Martin. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. I love you, bro. Thank you, bro.